For all of you who have been waiting for January 2nd, you saw that first video back in the middle of October and saw how it closed with launching January 2nd. We are finally here. Good evening, race fans, and welcome to the first ever official broadcast of Podium Esports. This is the season opener for the 2019 Podium Esports Street Stock Series, live tonight from the 2014 version of Michigan International Speedway in the Irish Hills of Michigan. We're going to be technical about it. I am James Pike, the voice of Podium Esports. Alongside me in the booth is David Shieldhouse, and we've got Cisco Scaramuza punching all the buttons in the production trailer downstairs. And David, I think excited is probably an understatement to say the least, because we have finally made it to regular season competition. Good evening, James, and hello, race fans. Yes, we're finally here. It's January. It's the start of a new racing season, and I could not be more excited. We get to kick it off here on a Wednesday with the Street Stock Series. It's been a huge buildup. You've seen lots of racing action over the past five weeks on Thursdays and Sundays for the Elite and Truck Series, but here we are. The focus is on the Street Stocks, the big two-miler of Michigan. Boy, James, it's good to be here. It's good to be at the racetrack, and it's good to be up in the booth with you. Definitely echo those sentiments and say ditto to you on that. So now that we're here, let's talk a little bit about the combination we've got. The Street Stocks tonight at Michigan, which I guess is about the closest thing to a super speedway that you're going to see more often than not. It's a very big slew of short tracks that you're going to see on the schedule for the Podium Esports Street Stock Series in 2019. But tonight... It's two and a half miles. It's pretty much flat out all the way around. But the way these things handle the draft, that's going to make all the difference for the drivers and crew chiefs and everybody trying to figure out how to get around this place the fastest. Well, the draft will definitely come into play here, and these drivers are going to have to do a little bit of that famed co-opetition. We already saw in practice sneaking in a little bit early. These guys are going to be running in packs. It's going to look like the cup cars at Talladega or Daytona. And that always leads to some very exciting stuff. These guys are going to have to mind their P's and Q's, listen to their spotter, so they're not running into the competition. But you're going to see some big runs, some dramatic moves, and guys trying to jostle through the pack to go from the back to the front if they're going to be at the front on lap 75 to take a checkered flag. 75 laps tonight. You already hit on the first big piece of information. We're going to go for 75 lap feature, which is going to be a lot of fun with... 29 cars that have taken time tonight, David. Again, two that may come in on the back of the grid, but still, we're going to have almost 30 cars at minimum for a street stock race here at Michigan. Impressive? No. Oh, absolutely. That's a very sizable field, and it's not just the size of the field. It's not the quantity. It's also the quality. We look through, and we'll talk about a lot of these drivers here tonight, and we'll read them off once we get the starting lineup here in just a few moments, but I'm already looking through tonight's roster, and some big names when it comes to the iRacing service have come out here on a Wednesday night to wheel the street stocks around Michigan. I'm really excited to see these guys go wheel to wheel in something a little bit different, a little bit different when it comes to horsepower, a little bit different when it comes to body work but nonetheless we're going fast we're turning left and it's going to be very exciting it's about to say i looked through some of this list and I, I already see a few folks who have found their way into the podium esports elite series which will open up for the silver division tomorrow night by the way if you're so curious to come back here i see a lot of names that have signed up for the Buddy Esports Truck Series and are going to go on Sunday night when they kick off their season at Daytona 2007, as well as a few drivers who will feature in the Cars Esport Tour for 2019, which will get going next week. A lot of great racing still to come here. We're only two days into January, and I just look ahead at the schedule of events that we're going to be covering here on Podium Esports. It's almost too much to take in, but a lot of names, we're going to see them run in all these different series, and that's what really makes it fun. Our drivers wanting to get different disciplines under their belt here with us, so they want to try their hands in the street stock. They want to jump into a late model, try out the cup car. Heck, they might even jump into a full-fledged truck as well on Sundays. So plenty of opportunities to see your favorite driver here on Podium Esports. going to be a lot of fun here as we get set to begin to put everybody up on this grid i know we are closing in on drivers to the grid that should come up momentarily 
And now that I start seeing cars on the grid, how about we go ahead and bring you your first starting lineup for the 2019 season here at Podium Esports. It's the first race for the first series of four that will get going and we'll begin with our pole sitter, the driver, the number 68, Ralph Vanderhorst. We'll start from P1. Outside of him in the second spot, when he decides to show up, <laughs> will be Brett McCoy in the number 29 machine. Jose Mejia will start from the third position. Fourth will be the number one of Tim Cruitt. Darren Cole will roll off from the fifth spot. Jeremy Adams will start from sixth. Reed Rundell will begin tonight from seventh. Keith Haney will start from eighth. And then Herman Reynolds and Jake Watson will round out your top 10 in the starting grid. Rolling off from the 11th starting spot will be Tom Morano. Troy Lent will be to his outside in 12th. It'll be Robert Arch, 13th. Stevie Minson, a guy to keep an eye on there in 14th. John Lyday will roll off from 15th. Nathaniel Cherry in 16th. Wesley Whitfield, 17th. Johnny Shade in 18th. It'll be Jade Bell in the 19th starting spot. And Rory Bloom in 20th. Starting 21st will be the 34 of Kyle Harbin. Jacob Porter will roll off tonight from 22nd. 23rd is where you'll find the 32 of Callan Martin. Dave Coburn will start from the 24th position this evening. Frank Morales will roll off from 25th. 26th is where you can find the 53 of Derek Patterson. Jeremy Watkins will start from 27th. Blake Neer begins from the 28th spot. Jonathan Lawrence will start from 29th. Lawrence was the last driver to take time. Brian Simpson and Dominic Warwick are 30th and 31st should they choose to come race here on the grid for this first race of the 2019 Podium Esports Stream Stock Series from the 2014 edition of Michigan International Speedway. It's a big track. It's a fast track. No matter what car you're racing here, you've got two miles to work with. It's it's almost like the same sort of joke that you see at the Auto Club where it might be two miles if you run the apron, but two and a half if you run up top. And regardless, though, in either case, you've got five degrees of banking on the back stretch that they're about to come out to 12 degrees on that front stretch that d leg where you have the start finish line and people will dive all over to the inside of the outside and 18 degrees of banking in the turns at this circuit which opened up in 1968 so just over 40 years old now is this track in brooklyn michigan david final thoughts before we go green here 29 street stocks ready to go all over this racetrack. And don't let the length fool you. This is still a fairly narrow racing surface. It's a little bit deceptive from what you see on camera here. These guys are going to be fighting to get to the bottom. But as the run goes on, I imagine they're just going to take what they can get and go where guys aren't to try and work their way through the field. James, it's about that time to get the first green flag of the season. Well, many thanks to all of you following along on Twitch. Make sure you drop a line in the chat to say hi, and we'll see what we can do to get in touch with you. But We'll go ahead and turn our attention now to the racing, which begins the 2019 Podium Esports season. The first green flag is out, and we are underway from Michigan International Speedway. And Ralph Vandervoorst is going to stick it right down to the bottom, although Brent McCoy got a decent start there on the outside. A few drivers already trying to shuffle in the back as they start beginning to fan out as they come through one and two, as people tend to do in Michigan no matter what the car is. But Vandervoort should be able to take the lead on the outside. They'll try and slide up in front of McCoy. Can't quite do it, though. And we may end up three wide here as they come down the back straightaway, but they'll think better of it. So it'll be McCoy and Vandervoort side by side for the lead as they go into turn three for the first time. Side by side won't be the last time we see that here tonight at Michigan. Ralph Vandervoort's got the preferred line on entry. That shorter radius around the bottom is definitely what these street stocks like. They don't necessarily have the high horsepower to help pull them around at a high rate of speed, only doing about 145, but you'll see him use the draft now as the 46 of Jose Mejia will drop down to the inside. Almost three wide now for the lead across the start finish line. Mejia on the bottom, Vandervoort in the middle, and it's going to be Brent McCoy up top going three wide for the lead, James Pike. I knew it. They were going to go three wide on the first lap at some point, and they haven't stopped because they're still three wide there, just a little bit further back for about fourth, fifth, and sixth. You've got Jake Watson there. Darren Cole is right there. Tim Pruitt trying to find his way up towards the front of the field. They're really beginning to fan out now right at the front of this, but it's still Ralph Vanderforce, and now Jose Mejia trying to find his way around all this too. Put Jake Watson in the 88 up to third. Now looking on the inside second car on the inside lane there in front of Jose Mejia as they go three wide for 
fourth, fifth, and sixth. That's the one of Tim Pruitt up on the outside, the red machine. Here comes the 43 of Reed Rundell through the middle. You see these guys try and manipulate that draft to their advantage. Got to time these runs real carefully, and that's the thing. You use that draft, you suck up to the guy in front of you. You got to be careful when you get there. If you have a place to go that you're clear to make that move, right now nobody making the big sweeping moves, but it's still early on. James Vanderbor slides up the hill just a little bit to block off the advances of Brett McCoy. He's got that thing really, really on the edge as he comes out of two. It looks like it was a little bit sideways on corner exit, but he manages to slide up in front of Brent McCoy to maintain that lead. I think, though, as we look at some of these drivers and as you look at the front of this field, for the most part, those who are the most successful are about the top eight to ten who have sort of stretched it out over the rest of this field. And that's because they're running this almost like a restricted plate track as we have two cars in the wall hard towards the back of the field. I have a feeling we're probably not far removed from the first caution as Jade Bell goes barrel rolling down the front straightaway. I also see the 74, Brian Simpson, going through the grass as well. He comes to a stop, gets it turned around, leaving uh, some marks in the landscaping there. They don't charge, uh, you know, extra for that, I guess. But nonetheless, he gets away with a little bit of damage. But, yeah, trouble breaks out there off of turn four, James. A couple drivers involved. Yeah, I think as I look at the replay, Jay Bell just started coming up the track, and I don't think he realized that he had a car right there underneath him. It was the 24 of Tom Morano. Morano, luckily, was able to get down to the apron and uh, managed to back it down pit road without too much damage, but Bell managed to completely barrel roll his car down the front straightaway right once he hit the wall. That's a piece of evidence of just how quickly these cars travel here at Michigan, but he just slid up and Drove right across the nose of the 24, went around, caught the wall, and then just started tumbling like a tumbleweed down the front straightaway. Still an early end to the evening for the number nine machine. And we'll see what Murano does. He certainly doesn't have enough damage to end his night, but there is enough damage that it will slow him down a little bit. So we'll watch him on pit road and see what decision he makes as to whether or not he'll continue in the race. I imagine that 24 will be hard pressed to find the necessary speed to keep up with most of these undamaged vehicles. and. Yeah, indeed, Jade Bell uh, pulls it off and calls it a night terminal damage there with the smoke pouring out of the back of the number nine machine. So unfortunate, a couple cars caught up there. But yeah, I think to your point, James, that gives you an idea of just how quickly things can break out despite the relatively low speed. And I say low speed, it's still 145 miles an hour plus uh, in the draft. So they're not just, you know, inching along by any stretch. But um, yeah, it, when it goes wrong, it can go very wrong. But uh, as we look out front, Brent McCoy was able to come away with the lead there when the yellow flag flew, and uh, Ralph Vandervoorst falls back to third. So the early leader now back to third, a new name out front in Brent McCoy. I also noticed that Tom Morano did come off of pit road, so he's out in a way. Derek Patterson also got a significant amount of damage in that wreck and has now parked it on pit road. Looks like he's trying to repair the car. We'll see if he returns, but there's a significant amount of damage to the front end of the number 53 machine. Meanwhile, Herman Reynolds was the one car, I think, in this field that came down for regular four tires and fuel service under this yellow flag. So one driver taking advantage of the caution to get a little bit fresher rubber and some fuel in there and it didn't really cost him much because he had found his way back into 27th and was at the back of the field in any case so one of those cases where you figure if you're already back there take advantage of the fact that you don't really have any track position to lose and go get a few fresh tires just to make it happen absolutely i like the strategy there i'm surprised more guys didn't subscribe to it to be perfectly honest with you if you're you know anywhere from 16th on back or so i would say it was worth the risk even after running only a handful of laps maybe three green flag laps there to come down and get fresh rubber can make a difference here and if the caution comes out you may want to stay out then uh and after everyone else pits so i'm um, surprised more people didn't take uh the opportunity to come down pit road but that tells me these drivers have the long term in mind when it comes to this race knowing there's still 69 laps to go in the event as the Lights go out atop the iRacing.com pace car so the field will get formed up too wide and get ready to go back to green flag racing. I already realize I'm getting slated for it here on the first broadcast, so I will make the point here since there is a little bit of confusion. Uh, I say the tires more as an expression of speech, but technically speaking, yes, drivers in the Street Stock Series are not allowed to get tires. So. Whoops. Yeah. Eh. But it, you, you know the sort of sensibility with the fuel and everything. It, it's the same sort of principle. Um, just without the fresh rubber to go along with it. So uh, in the meantime, though, lights are off on the pace car, and 
Let's look at the top 10 here as we reset for this restart, which will take place on lap seven. Leaders now Brent McCoy, then Jake Watson to his outside in P2. Ralph Vandervoorst will start from third. Reed Rundell will go from fourth. Robert Arch, fifth. Tim Fruitt, sixth. Jose Mejia, seventh. Jeremy Adams, eighth. Johnny Shady has come up from the 18th spot tonight. Painting is 10th at the moment. And that's how they'll line up for our first restart of the evening, which will come on lap seven. Pace car pulls down onto pit road and the field is now in control and in the hands of brent mccoy who will wait and wait and wait and then go a little bit late in the restart box so we'll see if that makes anybody check up here momentarily so they're all going to get away clean but i see a few drivers trying to peek out and make moves especially towards the back of the field here one car way up on the outside i can't quite tell who that is it's the o3 of darren cole who I think saw a few drivers stack up in front of him and trying to make something happen on the outside. He'll get a good run coming out of turn two back at the front of this field. They're still side by side and trying to bang doors are Jake Watson and Ralph Vandervoorst as they fight for second. It's still Brent McCoy, though, leading them down the match straightaway. Side by side for the first three rows, and they get down to one car and then double wide once again. I'm still watching the 03 of Darren Cole did a great job on the restart to take advantage of those stack ups and get himself some positions there, but Brent McCoy holding on to the lead on the bottom side. Jake Watson doing everything he can in the 88, trying to pull the highest side around. He's got help from behind from Robert Arch in the 16, but three cars down low, two cars up top. I know the math works. The draft uh, advantages on the bottom side right now, but give the uh, call to Jake Watson. The 88 got a power move down the front straightaway. He holds it for now, a neck and neck battle into one. And they make contact. I had a feeling that was going to happen, but somehow they save it. Oh, that was close. That was very, very close. So now, how unsettled is the 68 of Ralph Vandervoort? He'll slide back a few spots at least after that very, very, very scary incident there in the corner. Just about wrecked in front of the field, but they'll keep it straight for now. Meanwhile, Watson will jump right in front of Brent McCoy to take the lead away from the 29 machine. They're fanning out here two and three wide in three and four, but Watson got a little bump back and then almost got another bump there from I think that's the 16 of Robert Arch who was there on the outside so not a lot of love for the leader here everybody drafting almost like it's a restrictor plate track and that means that the cars running in second and third will be able to suck up a little bit easier and have that slight edge on speed coming out of the corner have a feeling that might not be the last time we see drivers give each other a little love tap on corner exit the question is whether or not someone's car will get unsettled like Ralph Vandervoort did a few laps ago in turns one and two Oh, you got to be careful there. I'm watching Robert Arch try and give a little bit of a bump draft to Jake Watson. He was a little unsure of the move, and you got to be careful. You don't want to put that bump draft on the quarter panel itself. You really want to be square when you try and push the guy in front of you. And here comes Arch up the racetrack just a little bit. Now he's down on the bottom side trying to take the lead away as they're side by side again, three rows deep. I'm still watching the 03 of Darren Cole. We talked about and had a great restart. Now worked his way up to the fourth position, James. Can you believe it? He's gained up some eight positions since the through the field now following the 88 of jake watson around on the high side but robert arch out front in the 16 doing a nice job there and i think you're right i think there still will be contact and it's whoever's going to be bravest but if you're the guy getting the bump you really got to have a lot of faith in your competition they're going to do it the right way I'm watching anyone who's on that inside lane because the drivers on the outside, regardless of whether or not you're that first car in the line or the second car in the line, it looks like they're getting just a slightly better run out of the corner. It means that they're not necessarily right up on each other's bumpers on quarter exit, whereas everyone on the bottom is really, really bunched up down there. And obviously with the lack of space between cars, that helps the draft work a little bit better. And you do go a little bit faster, but you also run the risk of getting a little bit of a bump to unsettle your car from behind, especially if you're in the position that Robert Arch is in right now. I want to go back, though, to the idea of restrictor plate racing, because as you look at this pack, you'll see that the drivers who are treating this like restrictor plate race and trying to run with that sort of mentality are the drivers who are up at the front of this field. And I think that's the way you sort of have to approach this. No, it's not Daytona. No, it's not Talladega. But then again, do you need two and a half or two and two thirds miles if you're in a street stop? No, you don't. You just need the two to really do it. So that's the sort of way I think you have to think about this. And the setup has obviously been tweaked just a shade here for everyone to account for that. But, uh, you know, even though this isn't a plate track for the cup cars, we don't really think of it as one. In this case, I think that mentality is very beneficial to have as you run a race around here in the street stops. 
Well, we've seen aggression be one of the best traits that successful plate track drivers can have. Guys like Joey Logano, Brad Keselowski, aggressive drivers in their own right. They win a lot of plate races these days because of that. And here we see the 18 up into the wall. That's Nathaniel Cherry getting up into the wall in turns one and two. Everyone ducks down out of the way as he loses all his momentum down the backstretch, but no event there. But, yeah, I think aggression is really the, uh, the the order of the day here. The guys that are aggressive are the ones that are going to go to the front, and Jake Watson takes the lead. Darren Cole falls into second place as he continues his march through the field. But the guys that really get aggressive and really push the envelope, I think, are the ones that are uh, by nature going to get the most positions gained. But as a, uh, an exact causation of that, they're also at the most risk to cause an incident as well. They're going to get aggressive on bump drafts, aggressive on side drafting and banging doors a little bit, making uh, late moves into corners, but they're going to make positions because they're going to scare their competition a little bit. Some guys don't want to push that hard, but everything comes at a cost, James Pike, and sometimes that aggression can come with a uh, incident into the wall as Darren Cole now makes his move down to the inside, down the back straight away. Really, really big move there from Darren Cole. And speaking of wall, I saw Tim Pruitt at least get up near the wall the last time around in three and four. Didn't quite tell if he got up into it the same way Nathaniel Cherry did coming out of turn two a lap ago. But I think that's something you have to watch. You'll see drivers jump to the outside because you can keep your car wound up there. And if you play it right, you can get a run off the top side as you see Robert Arch uh, handling that pretty well and doing just that here. Getting a run on the 88 of Jake Watson to try and go get the lead again. But if you run up too high, like, oh, as they almost make contact coming into one there. But if, if you run up too high the same way Cherry did and the same way Pruitt did, then you end up in the marbles and you lose the ability to turn the car. It tightens up, you hit the wall. And especially at a track like this, running at the speeds that we're running at, you hit the wall once, you're gonna do enough damage to the aerodynamics of your car that it will significantly hurt your chances to win this race as they run from the front. Robert Arch came down in front of the 22 and they start wrecking behind. Arch goes around. That'll absolutely be another yellow flag. A few more cars involved here as they come around. I saw Tim Pruitt is up and rolling around, barrel rolling and then flying through the air, almost like a gymnast at the Olympics before he settles back down onto the racetrack. So. Pruitt took a very, very big lick out of this, but he's not the only one. But that all started when Robert Arch came across the front of John Lyday's nose, tried to save it, overcorrected, spun back up into the racetrack, and then from there it was on. Never good when a car comes back up onto the racing surface after getting spun around with all these guys come with a huge head of steam. Just one of those track blockers is a huge impact for Tim Pruitt and the number one. I also saw the seven of Frank Morales get involved as well, but an absolutely catastrophic wreck there. And you see just the slightest of contact up front. It looked like uh, the 16 was just trying to make his entry into the corner and well, somebody wasn't having it and, and they didn't really lift and around he went and he fought it as best he could but you try and overcorrect like that at that speed you have a very low likelihood of bringing it back and unfortunately for him and other drivers Reed Rundell being one of them uh, that's going to be a premature end of their night I was going to say Reed Rundell got caught up in that Callan Martin got caught up in that incident trying to see if there was anybody else that got it I think oh, that should have been at least one more person um, I'm bouncing here, trying to find, there we are. I think the seven of Frank Morales got a little bit of damage out of that, although not too much damage in fairness. So he might be good enough to continue, but yeah, Rundell, Arch and Pruitt were absolutely the three that got the worst of that. And everybody else sort of escaped. But for those three, I would say their chances to win tonight are probably over, if not their race entirely. I would agree with that at a track like this. And you were making that point earlier. Keeping uh, keeping the car clean, not taking on any damage is really one of the biggest keys to success because you hurt the bodywork, you hurt the aerodynamics, the car is not going to cut through the wind as well. And in these large packs where aerodynamics is so important, you're not going to get out front. You can't push through the field when you have damage like that. So uh, keeping the fenders clean is, is definitely high up on the list for these drivers. And any incident, whether you brush the wall or you know, run smack into another car, that's pretty much going to be a race killer right there. And for these guys, the race will come to an end on about lap 15. Very, very quick in there. And a reminder, we still have a significant amount of laps to go. Only working lap 16 of 75 at this point. So I have to believe there are a few drivers out there that are just asking the question, why on earth are we trying to go so hard and do this so crazily this early in the race? Uh, certainly a question that I suppose you could ask if you're in that driver's seat. But again, at the same time, you recognize that 
these are, in fact, race car drivers. They are going to go for the gap, as Ayrton Senna said so eloquently so many years ago back in Formula One. So uh, on one level, I suppose it's also not a surprise that we're seeing drivers, especially at the front of the field, be so aggressive so early. Oh, way to quote the uh, late, great Ayrton Senna. I appreciate that. And he was right when he said it. Uh, aggression, I think, is going to be the only way that you're going to make up positions. You're you're just not going to go anywhere sitting and being quiet in the pack. And one guy that really caught my eye was John Lyday in the 22. Um, and, and unfortunately, he was caught up in that incident. Uh, but he was really working his way through the field well and got up to the position to be fighting for the lead by being aggressive, making moves, cutting down and changing lanes. If you pick the wrong lane, it can be a death sentence for you, much like plate racing at Talladega or Daytona. You got to uh, choose the right lane. And John Lyde had done a great job of that. Uh, he won't be able to leverage that, at least for the time being. But uh, nonetheless, the guys that are able to do that and work their way through traffic, sometimes it's going to take some big risk and it's worth the payoff. But uh, again, risk first consequence going to be the question of the night. So, uh, I think the light a case here is our first good example of the equal fault rule for incidents that will be used for any sort of standard caution that we have in any podium esports series for 2019, regardless of whoever may be deemed at fault in the eyes of you know, fans, the viewers, the drivers, whatever. If two drivers are involved, two or more involved in the start of an incident like Lyde and Robert Arch were, both drivers will get EOL penalties and go to the back of the field. And now, of course, for Arch, it's sort of a moot point with the damage that he had. But for Lyde, it does flip him back there after he'd made his way up to the front, as you said, David. So the question will be, especially if you're back there now and you know that everybody's racing so hard at the front of the field, do you really want to push your way right back up so early? Do you really want to go for it, thinking that it might take a solid 50 laps and it might take the rest of the race to get back up to the front of this with the field as big as it is? Or do you sit in the back and wait it out more and maybe see if they wreck a few more times in front of the field and by extension make your job of trying to come back to the front a little bit easier than it would be if you pushed? You know, there's a couple of schools of thought when it comes to how to handle that situation. One says that you push now, make up the positions, and put yourself in the position to fight for the lead or at least a position near the front, uh, and then spend the rest of the race defending it. Uh, the other school of thought says that you are patient. You uh, sit in the back and, and try and avoid any wrecks that happen. The downside to the latter is as you take more laps to take your time to get to the front, you run out of time to get to the front. And uh, in that sense, I don't really like that strategy, especially when we've seen it be so challenging at times here in these street stocks at Michigan to make up positions. I think you want to take your time now while you still have time on your side and get into that position to be up front and then defend from there. Because uh, if it does take you 20 laps, you don't want to wait too long because then you're just going to run out of laps at the end and you're going to be sitting wondering why you did that. At any rate, any strategy you can always look back on with hindsight being 2020 and say, well, maybe that wasn't the right way to go about it. But there's only one way to find out. And these drivers will tell the story with their driving behaviors going forward. But here on lap 18, coming to start 19, I imagine we'll see a split mentality when it comes to what they're going to do. We'll see how drivers react to this most recent wreck here. So we come to the restart on lap 19. Your top 10 for this restart will be as follows. McCoy, Watson, Vandervorst, Haney, Whitfield, Cole, Blum, Mejia, Lint, and Blake Near. As the pace car is pulled off here, Brett McCoy will go once again with Jake Watson to his outside. Another clean restart, it looks like, for the most part. McCoy got a very good one this time. Watson didn't get the greatest of them, and I think that the 87 of Keith Haney might have made a little bit of contract. McCoy swerves all over the place to block them all. Ralph Vandervoort comes underneath Jake Watson, and he may well take second away before we get to turn two. So it might be McCoy and then Vandervoort, and then you've got Jake Watson side by side with the 71 of Wesley Whitfield for that third position as they go three wide down the back straight. Keith Haney in that 87 giving a big shove. Look out, there's a block. That's not going to work. That almost got real ugly real fast. They've thought better of it before they all squeeze in the outside fence, but great run down the back straightaway. You can see how the effect of a good bump draft works for the driver in front as Jake Watson looked like he had 15 more horsepower than his competition. But give a call to the 71 of Wesley Whitfield doing a nice job in the 71, that black and blue machine on the bottom side. Haven't talked about him yet tonight, but here comes trouble for the, the, uh, the 29 of Brent McCoy as he's going to get split by Vandervoorst and Watson now put him in the middle 
Vandergorst on the bottom side trying to get back to the lead where he was earlier in this race. And that's really the effects of the draft in motion for you there, James. Oh, they just tried to dust poor Brett McCoy coming down the front straightaway, but he managed to get it all back as we wreck. Big wreck right there on the back straightaway. One car up on his lead. It's the 72 machine of Rory Blum, who somehow manages to not totally screw the thing up, but the 72 came up in front of, that was the 46 of Jose Mejia. He tried to slide up just a little bit and wasn't quite clear and just drove across the nose. I think for me, the more amazing thing is that we didn't see more drivers get caught up in that. I think the 89 of Jeremy Adams might have caught just a piece of that on his right front quarter panel, but for the most part, it was really just Blum and Mahu who took the front of the damage in that incident. Yeah, really fortunate that that did not collect more cars, especially on that point of the racetrack coming off of turn two. The banking falls away, you get to the flats, and it's tough to maneuver in a big pack like that. But fortunately for Rory Bloom, he doesn't get caught up by anybody else. It's a tough deal for Jose Mejia. It's just one of those things where it's two cars in close proximity and, and trying to maintain control uh, just in the same part of real estate there. And unfortunately for Bloom, he gets uh, one and a half rolls over, but lands on the wheels and can drive away. I don't think the damage is too bad. I'm not sure he's going to be super competitive, but I don't think his race is coming to an end either. I think the the weirdest thing about Michigan, both in this configuration and in the newly rescanned one, the I racing just put out not too long ago, is that this track is so wide and you've got three, four, five lanes in some places to run. And yet, for whatever reason, it seems like turn two especially, drivers just tend to bunch up there the same way they do, I think, of turn two at Texas turn four at Charlotte, just those sort of traditional places where people tend to bunch up and run up into each other because they're all racing for the same spot, trying to take the same line. And we end up with wrecks like that where people go flying all over the place. A bit of a miracle to me. I, I, I thought for a long period of time there that Blum was going to get T-boned by somebody, but somehow, some way, he was the only one that really took a big piece of damage in that. So the question is going to be, can he get back out and run and not be too terribly bent into pieces? Or is his race, for the most part, largely done as I see Robert Arch try and come down and get his car fixed? Well, I think that speaks to the caliber of drivers we have here in the field tonight, not causing a bigger incident when you got a car sideways, basically, in the middle of the racing groove off of turn two. So, uh Everyone in the field should be patting themselves on the back for not creating a bigger uh, disturbance there uh, for Rory Bloom, especially. He was probably sitting there thinking, well, when's the next hit coming? I can't wait. But it didn't happen. So uh, good for him and good for the rest of the field as Jake Watson finds himself at the front. Uh, he's been up front a couple of times. Brent McCoy has been a name that's been up there a lot as well. Keith Haney in third and some tense moments before that yellow flag flew we talked about guys ganging up on the leader and you saw it there when they split them down the front straightaway and really unsurprisingly or maybe surprisingly depending on who you are uh after all that and all the drama no change for the lead so those guys split out uh hit the air of wall after using the draft and couldn't go anywhere so we'll see how everything resets here as we continue to work the yellow flag here i'm watching the pace car to see if the lights go off this time like i think they may just and as we come down the start finish line lights stay on the pace car so we'll at least be going for two more laps here david so uh, i suppose we'll take a moment to uh, just sort of review everything that's happened in the world of podium esports so far as we look ahead to all the action that's going to take place this week for those uninitiated uh, the launch came in the back end of October and uh, in the final month of the year and changed. So it started in November. We ran qualification series for the Podium Esports Elite Series, which will run the Class A stock car, and the Podium Esports Truck Series, which will run the Class C truck uh, for 2019. And for the final five weeks of the year, those two series ran qualification series to split drivers into our gold and silver divisions, which we'll have set up, uh, the first of which you will see tomorrow night when the silver division of the Elite Series has their debut at Daytona 2007 right here on the Podium Esports Twitch channel. Uh, for those two series, there's a little bit of work that's already happened, but for the other two, 
the Podium Esports Street Stock Series that you're seeing right now, and the Cars Esport Tour, the official esports competition of the Cars Tour, the premier late model racing series throughout the Carolinas and Virginia of the United States. Uh, those two have not run qualification series, so this is the first time that you're getting the chance to see any sort of action uh, from either one of those series within Podium Esports competition. The same will be the case for the Cars Esport Tour. Uh, and it won't be too long before you see them because they get going next Wednesday night, January 9th. They'll begin their season at Southern National. So if you like late model stock racing, then definitely go ahead and head on down there for that. But we've got the four series lined up to run you through July 2019 and more plans to come here as we roll through this first year of competition for Podium Esports. Lights have gone off on the pace car here, so we're going to get the restart on lap 25 of 75. Already a third of the way through this just about. Here is your order of the top 10 when they come back around to take the green. Jake Watson will be your leader here in the control car on the restart. Brent McCoy will start from second. Keith Haney will begin from third. Ralph Vandervoorst will roll off from fourth. Wesley Whitfield starts from fifth. Blake Near. Begin from sixth. Darren Cole will start from seventh. Jacob Porter started 22nd and is now running eighth. Troy Lent is going to begin from ninth and Jeremy Adams from 10th. And I, I make a point of Porter's run up to the field. He's plus, I think, 14, if I've got my math correct for this race so far. But also a very big call to Blake Near, who started 28 on the grid of 31 cars, or 30 cars rather. And is already up to the sixth position. So a big, big run for Blake Near. Now that he's near the front of the field, no pun intended, mm. we'll see what he can do to get that 14 car at the front of it. But the pace car is down and on pit road. Jake Watson has control of this field as we restart for, I believe, the third time, fourth time. I'm beginning to lose track now, which might be a bit problematic. But in either case, Watson goes, and it's a pretty even restart between Watson and Brent McCoy. Vanderforce looked like he got a good run, though. Maybe a little bit too good of a run. He ducks at the outside, tries to find a way around McCoy. Didn't quite have the momentum to do it, so McCoy will stay up there. Vanderforce will hang around there in that second or third spot. He's under fire from the 87 of Keith Haney, and now the 71 of Wesley Whitfield, but they're two by two as they come down on the back straight away this time. McCoy fighting off a field uh, a field full of Hatfields. I think that's the joke I was trying to make before I fumbled it, but oh, anyway, old-timey reference, good stuff nonetheless, as they're still side-by-side -side for the first three rows. McCoy on the outside doing a nice job holding onto that lead, but Watson really wants to be up front and dictate the pace as best he can, but Keith Haney, Ralph Vanderforce, Blake Neer all have different ideas, and yeah, Blake Neer doing a nice job working his way from the back to the front. That's impressive. Avoided all the wrecks that have plagued the field thus far and has put himself in a good position. They're three wide for third place up on the top side of where the leader rolls. But they're still three wide working through one and two. And here comes a car on the bottom washing up ever so slightly. He gets a hold of it. Nice job there on the bottom side. That's the three of Jacob Porter making things a little bit sweaty. Is there three wide, two rows deep down the back straightaway? Oh, they just don't want to run too wide. Too wide's too boring here. You have room for it. It's the street stocks. It's Michigan. Why not? Just send it. Let her rip. It's the attitude that most of these drivers are displaying right now. In the meantime, though, looks like Brent McCoy has new competition here, and it's the 87 of Keith Haney that's now trying to run underneath the 29 to try to get the race lead as there's contact for second and third spot there. That was Wes Whitfield and, I believe, Blake Near who got together. So Wesley Whitfield able to hang on to it and continue his march towards the front. But... For now, it's Haney and McCoy, and McCoy nearly pinches him. That could have been a little bit parry if they didn't give each other a little bit of space. I wonder, though, if that same sort of move happens on lap 70 instead of lap 27. Do we see as much kindness from the drivers at the front of the field? Absolutely not. Guys are going to keep their foot in it if... They go wrecking, they go wrecking, but we got contact. The 023 of Troy Lent gets spun around on the entrance to turn three by the three of Jacob Porter, and he gets oh, smashed by the 74. Brian Simpson comes piling in, and caution will fly once again in turn three. Nowhere to go for the 74 of Brian Simpson, and I was wondering because the one car that had gotten down to the inside there, I can't quite tell who that was immediately. It was the 023 of Troy Lent had managed to save it for the most part and then just 
came up ever so slightly in front of the 74 of Brian Simpson and had nowhere to go and then caught up the 72 of Rory Blum who gets into an incident for the second time today he just had nowhere to go so he piles drove the 74 trying to avoid all this wreck so well, luck continues to get worse for Rory Blum but it was very close to not being a yellow, and then all of a sudden it was, I guess is the best way to put it. Not much you can do there, though, when you've got cars sort of sliding around. No, and unfortunately for Rory Bloom, perhaps uh, the karma that he built up from not getting more damage in his first wreck finally caught up to him there. Uh, the front end's all tore apart on uh, his vehicle, and I believe his race will come to an end there in turn three. But uh, just another deal, similar to like what we saw with uh, the 16 of Robert Arch, guys trying to make their entry and uh, trying to put a move over on the guy that's peeking to the inside, hoping that they're going to lift and cut him a, a break. But Porter had no such uh, intentions to do that, kept his foot in it. And as I was explaining that, I didn't think people would lift. There was a perfect example of that. Even here on lap 27 or uh, of this race, a guy just not giving the room or not giving the move to the guy trying to take advantage of him. So I think that's part of the excitement, part of the intrigue of what we see here. But in that case, Jacob Porter wanted nothing to do with it wanted nothing to do with it and i think it just emphasizes the importance of a good spotter when you have races like this when you've got big tracks and cars that don't necessarily get the most speed out of them so it ends up being like a plate track uh, we we know how busy the spotters are in the races at talladega and daytona where you know it just seems like a constant stream of information if you have the radio feed on you know one to your rear one to your right rear two back of you now this time by three clear on the way up uh, and all sorts of different crazy notes. I I just have a sneaking suspicion. If you have a good spotter tonight, that's going to make a huge, huge difference for you because with the way a lot of these drivers have been thinking that they're clear, but not actually have been clear, if you can have someone tell you, wait, 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 don't do that yet, it's going to help you out a lot in your bid to make it to the end and have a shot to win this thing. As somebody who's been fortunate enough to be a spotter in NASCAR competition, I can tell you it's not an easy job. Uh, and there's a lot of people who think they can do it, and then you put them in the situation, and they're just not comfortable. They can't communicate things quickly enough. They can't uh, see enough ahead to predict what's going to happen or help guide their driver in a helpful way. So it's a tall order to ask of anybody who's using a human spotter here tonight or at any point uh, during the rest of the racing season uh, to help them. But that's really the difference between the good and the great, the guys that can help you get through those situations and tell you you can't make that move, don't do it. Uh, but ultimately, it's the driver that has to make their decision. The spotter can only guide them or recommend something. Uh, the driver is ultimately responsible and the one holding the steering wheel. So if he decides to make that move, even against better judgment or better guidance, then you're going to see what happens there. And we don't know specifically if uh, you know there was a spotter involved there or not, but it's just a, a race and deal, close quarters, a guy thinking he could take advantage of the competition and make a, a, a sharp entry into the corner, and competition just wasn't going to give him the room. Just not a lot of room given here at all in this race. I think that's that's been the sort of wooden trademark that we've seen, at least on my end, from my perspective in this, is that there just isn't any willingness for anyone to give any sort of room. And when you have drivers running right up on each other, and I think especially in these cars where you know a lot of people won't be used to the difference in speed of the street stock versus something like you know, an Indy car or a truck or the B-class car or the A-class car here. You know, it, it's something where you have to adjust your frame of mind a little bit to account for the fact that you're only running 140 on these straightaways instead of 200. And I, I think, I, I honestly think that for a lot of these drivers, that's been tricky. That's been part of the trouble. And I think that's part of the reason why we're seeing so few drivers actually be able to successfully clear their competition when they get around them. You're just not used to something like this. And that's something that I think you're going to see a lot throughout the podium East Ford schedule because you're going to see a lot of tracks, especially in the Elite Series and the Truck Series, that you wouldn't necessarily expect to see in any sort of iRacing schedule. The Street Sox Series, in fairness, is a little bit more normal than the rest of them. But still a few wild ones that you wouldn't really think. Phoenix 2008 we get to the beginning of February is one that jumps out out to me. Rockingham is another one that I think of. Dover has a little bit more space and you might not be used to it because for most people, it's short track, short track, short tracks, short tracks. That's what everybody knows. 
and really the mark of a great driver is a driver that can see it succeed in a multitude of environments, different types of racetracks that will truly test them. So we take the street stocks and put them on the big two miler here at Michigan, not just the, sh the short tracks. And I think that's to the credit of the competition committee here at Podium Esports to come up with a creative schedule, a unique set of racetracks to take our drivers to and really put them through the ringer. And that's how you, I think, determine the best of the best. Don't just give them the same thing over and over or the expected thing. Really put them to the test. Put them in a situation that they're uncomfortable with, that they haven't tested before, that's new to them. And that's where you're really going to see the cream rise to the top. And I expect to see as 2019 uh, plays out that the drivers who stand atop each of these individual respective racing leagues are truly the best. I'll make a point here before we get green. A thank you to our new subscribers, Ashton Crowder, 27. DJ Shield House, I wonder who that might be. 4% uh, I don't know. Gamer, I wonder who that might be. Seabark32 and Maximum Lion, thank you all for subscribing to the Podium Esports Twitch channel where you're going to get more content off of that subscription in the coming days here. Back under green, though, at lap 31, it's Brent McCoy in the 29 machine who will lead them back, but I don't think he hit his shift all that well. Didn't get the greatest of restarts this time around because Keith Haney has managed to clear him by almost a car length as they come into turn one. Now, McCoy should be able to make that back up on the inside as they come through one and two. And as they come out of two, he might get a little bit of help from Wesley Whitfield to go straight to the front of this thing once again. So it should be Whitfield and McCoy. Maybe, no, because McCoy couldn't quite get the bump from Whitfield that he wanted. Meanwhile, Ralph Vanderforce and Keith Haney are up on the outside, locked in with each other. So it might be those two going to the front of this field. Who Trouble knows? We've behind. got cars. It's one spinning to the inside. Can they save the rest of it? No. Two oh, more, oh, no. Two, two and three as we have one barrel rolling. I think that's the 20 machine of Dave Coburn. We've got caught up in it. Robert Arch again in trouble. Rory Blum cannot catch a break to save his life. He got caught up in this once more. Let's see what else happened. The 2023 of Troy Lent also involved in this, as we see people come up. Yep, it was Troy Lent, Roy Blum, and Robert Arch, and then the 20. Uh, I think I'll have to go back just a little bit to see how that one began. But for the most part, it looks like the... Uh, so that was the 03 of Darren Cole, who... I don't yeah, no, I think it, it looks like to me that the 20 came down to the 03. He got the 03 loose, who then kind of ricocheted back into the 20. That's at the 20 up the hill into the side of the 22. And then when he made contact with the side of the 22, it just all went from there. Just guys jostling over the same position, maybe not being aware that they were three wide. I don't think uh, Darren Cole really knew that he was being put three wide right there. It was sort of setting up to take his normal entry into turn three, not realizing that the 20 of Dave Coburn was there with a the car to his outside. So they just sort of squeezed together and uh, it was on from there. But unfortunately, Rory Bloom gets caught up in yet another wreck. I saw Robert Arch in the 16th uh, get uh, involved as well. Those guys have hit everything but the lottery here tonight at Michigan, it feels like. And I believe this might be the, uh, the death blow for a couple of these machines that we've seen caught up in some different wrecks here tonight. At this point, there there's just no body work left. There's probably no motivation left in those drivers uh, who can't seem to find their way through without hitting something. So unfortunate, but uh, another big wreck here on lap uh, 33 has put us under the old flag one more time. Another yellow here as we continue to roll through this first race of the 2019 season for not just the Podium Esports Street Stock Series, but all Podium Esports series to come. And a reminder that this is not the only one tomorrow night. If you are so inclined, be ready to tune in to a very, very big night of competition. It is the first event for the Silver Division of the Podium Esports Elite Series. Going to get everything cracking here. 8.25 tomorrow night will be the opening time for our broadcast. We'll have two dual races and the season opening Daytona 200 for the Podium Esports Elite Series Silver Division. So you want to come back and see some of the best Class A drivers take their part in the best competition in sim racing. Uh, a, and yes, CMR 32, it will be a huge night of competition with massive championship implications if you still are... Uh, inclined to go all the way down that road. But, David, that's not necessarily my total cup of tea. 
No, not much for tea myself. I'm more of a uh, coffee guy. I take it black, and uh, that's how I get going in the mornings. But, yeah, you know, it's uh, – you want to talk about big names. We have some big names here tonight, but I look at the roster uh, for the Elite in the Truck Series. Holy cow. I look at some of these names on there, and, James, we all – we're looking at the guys signing up for these series as uh, time was moving on back in uh, October and November leading up to the qualification series kicking off. And some of these names that you'll see running right here on Podium Esports on Thursday nights and Sunday nights as well are guys you will see running, well, the biggest show available in iRacing on Tuesday nights. And uh, that's really exciting to see the top level talent come here to duke it out with the best competition available. And uh, boy, I can't wait to see how they get along. I think that there's going to be some surprise winners. I think there's going to be some drama. I think there's going to be some great racing action, some controversy, some rivalries, everything that you would want to see in racing. You're going to get it right here on Podium Esports. And uh, James and I, I, I know that I'll only speak for myself, but I feel safe in saying this. We're proud to give, uh, bring it to the fans and, and make them a part of it as well. Yes, yes. And to answer officially Aggressive Suits question, yes. Uh, we will be a good chunk of the team for most of the Podium Series. You'll have James Krahula alongside me for the coverage of the Elite Series up until March, but it's DJ Shuthouse, as he's known on here, and JVP5493 bringing you all the commentary for the Podium Esports competition in 2019, and that will also include the special events, the first of which will get underway on February 8th next month, the Podium Esports Daytona 500. If you're so inclined, $7,500 purse. Winner also gets a cockpit courtesy of GT Omega Racing. So, if you want to try your hand and become the first winner of a Daytona 500 and win the first ever Podium Esports special event that gets broadcast, you can go ahead and sign up on the Podium Esports website here momentarily. So, uh, but as you make the point, I want to go back to that incredible roster of drivers that is going to take part in the Elite Series, especially next week. Some drivers with experience in the Peak Series. Michael Guest, Matt Busa, Andrew Fayosh, Steve Sheehan, uh, drivers who have been there, done that at the top level. Some of the other top qualifiers, Callan Keister, Matt Busa, David Washington, Malik Ray, R.J. Williams, Dylan Jones, Nick Morse, Tommy Ryan, Carl Shedd, Ryan Hill, John Theodore. If you're so inclined, drivers you'll see tomorrow night include J.D. Laird, Dustin Littlefield, Corey Wharton, Trey Galgan, Corey Comforter, Jonathan Dickert, Carl Dodson, Barry Hines, Robert Hickson, Kyle Leverault, Jacob Porter, who's running tonight's race, James Ross, Sean Kalis, Michael Morley, Drew Adams, Sid of iRacing, just to name a few. But for now, I think you just we'll named them all. Oh, I didn't name them all. We still have about <laughs> 25, in fairness. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, in, in fairness. Uh, still, still, still a few names left there. But we'll get back to the race that we're on. Working lap 36, restart to come on lap 37. Top 10 as the pace car pulls off. Haney, McCoy, Vandervorst, Watson, Near, Whitfield, Adams, Cole, John Lyde, and Nathaniel Cherry has rebounded from that wreck to get back up into the top 10. As we get going once again, Haney continues to roll. Good run on the inside for him. He got a good restart, so I think he'll be able to maintain the lead when they come out of two. Watching a little bit further back in the field, right around Darren Cole, because I saw a little bit of bumping from Nathaniel Cherry, but he'll keep it in line and keep everything rolling. They'll puddle along here out into the back straight away and it will still be Haney there but McCoy got a good run on the outside they'll stay side by side a little bit of turbo well no a little bit of contact a little bit of help from I believe that's the 68 of Ralph Vandervorst Vandervorst has spent a lot of time at the front much ha much like Haney McCoy and Watson have been probably the big three or four names that we've seen up front all night long Look at the run on the outside as they both sort of fade out towards the wall. These guys really working together well. Uh, McCoy and Watson, that is, on the outside as they'll sort of break free from that inside lane now. Um, McCoy holding the lead down here on lap 38. Watson, how patient will he be riding behind him? Is he just in helper mode right now as a 71 of Whitfield works his way to the outside as well? But looking through here as they're just side by side with that outside lane, they run the middle through one and two, keep that inside lane pinched down. That's the right way to do it. You really kill the momentum of that inside lane if you're able to execute it. Now here comes Watson making a bid for the lead himself as they're side by side, three rows deep down the back straightaway. 
I think they finally settled down enough in this race to figure out that you don't really need to do more than two by two at this stage. So I know we'll definitely see more than that as we get closer to the end of it. But for now, it's a little bit McCoy in front, a little bit of Watson on the side, and then they wreck in the front of the field. McCoy made a little bit of contact with Watson, and they all go spinning in front. I don't want to count how many drivers just got caught up in that, but that will definitely change the picture of this race. They're still wrecking. Oh, the goodness. 18 and the 14 still going at it, but I think the list of drivers uh, not involved is going to be shorter than the list of drivers involved in this one here, and it all went wrong up front, James Pike. I'm looking at the replay myself now just to see what happened. Haney came up, just came up and got... I. I I think he, he, in another case, it looks like to me, it's another case where Haney thought that he was clear and there was a gap between, I think that's the 88 of Jake Watson and then uh, Wesley Whitfield there in the 71. But there wasn't, and they made contact, and then they all just started wrecking there. Whitfield got caught up in it. The 03 got caught up in it. 34 went spinning. Watson went around like a top there. The 89 went around. Keith Haney went around. The 07 went around. Just, uh, everybody basically so who knows we may end up having a demolition derby to settle this thing if we keep on going at this rate well you know i know some people do like to take these uh body style uh vehicles and take them to the demo derby and uh, that's all well and fine but that's not the objective here tonight but i tell you brent mccoy is one lucky driver i don't know what he's got shoved up where probably a horseshoe of the golden variety somewhere in the rectal cavity but he came out of that without any damage despite nearly getting turned head first into the outside wall he kept control of it through the grass and managed to avoid all the uh, the chaos one of the only front runners uh that didn't get damaged i don't think in that incident that was just an absolutely huge one right there through the grass everybody taking it on in some way some damage there and we cross lap 40 now. This would have served as the otherwise competition yellow, but uh, perhaps everyone can take a, a big uh, sigh of relief that didn't get caught up in that. That's the biggest wreck we've seen yet. Absolutely. That's the first one that's really changed things at the front of the field, and now I think everybody has some form of damage here at this point. I think we'll be hard-pressed to find a clean car as we see the chat light up with championship implications so uh, i guess that's our memo to make sure that we don't become our own meme david i uh, figure that's something that we can do uh, but we'll also let you know officially that uh, yeah officially officially that uh we are going to take the competition caution here at lap 40 and this will be the one chance where people can come down and get fuel and maybe try and set their cars up here so We'll see what sort of fun we can have. Also know that there's going to be a giveaway for a $10 Amazon gift card, courtesy of our admin Maximum Lion. So in fairness, I'm curious to see the trivia question because I was not made aware before the night of what the trivia question would be. I just knew that we would have one. So uh, David, you want to take a stab at this too? Maybe see who's 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 got the upper hand here in trivia? Uh, I've already been given a hint as to what genre uh, the question falls into. I'm sure I might be able to answer, but I've been told explicitly I am barred from answering it, that I'm not eligible for competition. So that's sad, but I guess that's fair. But uh, here we go. Sebastian Vettel ended the 2012 Formula One season as a three-time world champion. How many Grand Prix did the German win during the 2012 season? And the answers are pouring in. So we'll see who got it right first. See who got it right first. Also, that's my favorite driver, by the way, Sebastian Vettel. Sub, sub. Uh, you mean Super Mario? That's not what I call him, but uh, you know. Oh, I'll, I'll have to send you a video. Red Bull got smart and they put him in a a Mario Kart lookalike and gave him a Mario hat and uh, turned him into Super Sub. Because every time on the radio, he just goes woo 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 woo. <laughs> so, so. So he does make some great noises on the radio. I love I love listening to his radio. He's very entertaining. Also, congratulations to at zone 15 Tyler Dalton, who has managed to win the giveaway with the correct answer of five Grands Prix. That's Sebastian Vettel won in the 2012 season. So congratulations, Tyler. Go ahead. DM Maximum Lion so we can get you your card off. Now, we'll give you a quick note here before we take a commercial break. Uh, once we get this set up, the green will come out. They will continue to pace under green and then come back around for the comp yellow. That's how this is going to work when we get there. But for now, we're going to go ahead and take a break here. And if you haven't had the chance to see it, 
Go ahead and educate yourself on the first major special event the Podium Esports will host in 2019, the Podium Esports Daytona 500. History. Richard Petty goes back in front. They both spin. They're in the wall. Petty is sliding. Tradition. He's going to make it. Dale Jarrett's going to win the Daytona 500. Prestige. For the race leader for the win, Martin down low. Kevin Harvick wheel to wheel push wins. Passion. And Dale Earnhardt is going to win the Daytona 500 in his 20th try. All to find their way here. On the Daytona 500. On the Daytona 500. So rise above and become one of the greats the world center of racing. On February 10th, we invite you to join us to write a new chapter. This time, it's your turn. Welcome back to Podium Esports coverage of the season opener for the Podium Esports Street Shock Series. Live from Michigan International Speedway in 2014 in Brooklyn, Michigan. Drivers beginning to pace their way around under green, as weird as that sounds, but we're going to have a competition caution in here. The one competition caution of this race on lap 40. These drivers can come down, get fuel, maybe try and fix any sort of damage that they might have. I know we have a lot of crippled cars and crumpled cars in this race. It gives us a chance to catch our breath, but take a little bit of a break and sort of recap what we've seen in the first 40 laps. And though we've talked about it a little bit already, what have you seen from your perspective in the opening part of this race? Well, what I have seen up to this point, James, is a mixture of patience and high aggression between these drivers out here in Michigan. They know that they got underpowered vehicles. They've got aerodynamics and the draft playing into their advantage. Huge packs of cars. You got to pick the right lane. And ultimately, it's the guys who were avoiding trouble, the ones that are still running at this point. I know that sounds like a cop out to answer it that way, but it is true. The more aggressive these drivers have gotten, the more incidents we have seen. And a lot of it has been fairly benign in nature when it breaks out. Guys thinking that they're clear and it's just a, an inch that they're off and misjudging where their competition is. And it sets off this huge chain reaction. But when you look past all of the wrecks that we've had up to this point, the racing itself has been absolutely fantastic. Three, four wide at times side by side all the way around this two mile d-shaped oval in michigan and they're putting on one whale of a show and if this is any indicator of what the 2019 season has in store for us buddy like the chills i just got from that daytona 500 promo we are in for something special i couldn't agree more also a big thanks to r95 racing for signing up during the broadcast for the daytona 500 so we'll look forward to seeing you out there as you try and go claim that contract from GT Omega Racing and a big chunk of that $7,500 purse to win what should be a very, very, very big and fun event for your plate track racers, or racers on a racing shoot. I've, <laughs> I, I've half a mind that if I didn't have to actually call the race, I probably would jump in there and run it myself. But drivers now on pit row. They're within the middle of their 60 seconds to fix up whatever they need to fix up on their street stocks before we come back out and grid the field back up and get everybody under green once again. So I think on my end, to answer the same question, uh, 
a lot of really, really close racing, which gives me a lot of hope and promise for the rest of the season, especially with the Street Stock Series, because it's not just short tracks that they run. You would think that it would be primarily short tracks that the Street Stock run, and that they would barely go anywhere else. But the fact of the matter is that of the first five races, only two of them take place on short tracks. And then you look at the next batch of races, that next five, it's got another track over a mile in length in Dover International Speedway. So, you know, it's going to come up with a little bit more variety here. And I think you're going to have a lot more fun. Uh, but that's not to say the short tracks won't be bad either, especially when we get to Lanier on January 23rd, which will be the first race on a short track for the series and the second race of the season after the opener for the cars at Eastport. Yeah, that should be exciting. I think about these cars at Dover. Uh, what a what a proposal that is. Dover is hard enough uh, as it is, but my God, in these street stocks, they're going to be jumping and jiving all over the place, jumping down into those corners and lifting off on exit. That's going to be something to behold. But yeah, taking off to uh, Lanier, the short track, classic short track, unfortunately, not a place you can go and race these days in the real world, but still a home for great racing, and it was back in the day. So we see these guys start to get uh, formed up again. They're going to maintain their position. There's no position changes on pit road during this exchange, so they're going to form up on the backstretch, I guess, and that's good. But, yeah, I love the schedule. I, I think it's very exciting, and I look forward. I'm getting I'm getting my, my itch scratched a little bit here, James, just a little bit, but not enough that it's going to tide me over for a whole season. Uh, it's going to be a long two weeks before we see them again. Mm -hmm. Two weeks before we see them again, but if you have withdrawals for your short track racing, don't worry because where the street snacks take off, the Cars Esports Tour comes in. The official esports competition of the Cars Tour, the premier late model racing a series in the Carolinas and Virginia, kicks off their season next Wednesday night, January the 9th at Southern National Motorsports Park. We'll go there for the season opener. Two hundred laps to get around that track in the eastern part of North Carolina, all running the late model stock car that has proved to be so popular in seasons past with the Cars Esports Tour. And we'll continue it the next week, January 16th. We head to New Smyrna Speedway, home of the World Series of Asphalt Stock Car Racing in February. But for us, home to 150 laps of competition, and that'll be the second race on the schedule for the 2019 Cars Esports Tour. Then we come back to the street stocks at Lanier, and then the next week, it's one of our big Irwindale weeks. A lot of racing to come at Irwindale Speedway across all four series on Podium Esports. The Cars Esports Tour will get their crack at it on January 30th at Irwin Dale, and that will be all broadcast right here on the Podium Esports Twitch channel. Looks like the gridding is largely complete, I think, for the most part. It's not quite there, but we're getting close, David Shieldhouse, and we're getting close to Green Flag Racing once again. I'm ready for it. I love racing anytime, but yeah, give a call to the, the administrative staff competition uh, committee here at Podium Esports doing all this. This is not an easy thing to execute, mind you, still under green flag conditions technically uh, when you think about it and the fact that uh, they're doing all this sort of without much more than just voice commands, but a uh, great job by the, the drivers paying attention, doing the right thing here, getting formed up, and uh, then we'll be back underway. But I'm um, looking forward to seeing the late model series go into action uh, it's been a while since we've seen them here, and uh, last time while well, they ran, it was you and I in the booth at South Boston crowning a, a champion that night for two different divisions. And boy, what racing action we had that night. A lot of fun to see Matt Cucker get it done and win a championship in the most dramatic of fashions. It makes me wonder that for 2019, how do you top it? Well, you bring everybody from the old Championship Esports Association and the Simulation Stock Car Association together under one roof and you create Podium Esports. But, hey, I feel like someone's already taken that idea, dude. That was a good idea, whoever beat us to it. It's like Velcro. Why didn't I think of that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, let's see how things shake out here. They, they're just pacing under green, to be fair. Uh, not necessarily certain how this is going to shake out, but 
We're under green once again. There we go. All right. So uh, technically under green flag conditions, but this is your restart here after the competition break. So it's Brent McCoy and Nathaniel Cherry there, one, two. And Cherry's not wasting any time giving a little bit of help. Also, oh, look who that is, John Lyday, who got caught up in an incident earlier and was sideways in turn three, has now found his way up into the third spot, managed to clear Ralph Vanderhorst, now is underneath Nathaniel Cherry trying to take second away. Two cars that we've seen get into incidents here tonight. Nathaniel Chair on the outside in the 18. We saw him way up the track some 30 laps ago or so, brushing the wall and losing a lot of spots. But now he's up into the second spot. John Lyday, we saw him involved in an incident earlier as well, coming from the back to the front, doing a nice job as they're side by side for second. Through turns three and four, Vandervorst and uh, Johnny Shade. I haven't talked about him yet tonight in the 51. Cool name for him, but run the bottom side as well. Shading behind the 22 of John Lyday. See what I did there? Along with Ralph Vandervoort and the 14 of Blake Near continuing his march. So top six cars are sort of broken away just a little bit. And Herman Reynolds in the 09 runs a strong seventh. Just hanging out here. Lyday did not get good corner entry, though, that time. The man who did, though, is Nathaniel Cherry, who comes right underneath Brent McCoy. Did Cherry just get shot out of a cannon coming out of turn two or what? He gained about a car length and a half, maybe two, on the 29 machine and was able to get out in front by about a nose length before they came back together coming into turn three. But it still gave Cherry the inside here, so he may be able to get a decent run in the corner. The question will be what kind of run does McCoy get off of the corner on that outside lane with his car still wound up a little bit more than Cherry's. I have a feeling that this lap will go to the 29 of McCoy, but not by much as Blake Near comes right through the middle to try and grab the lead. Yeah, power move through the middle for Blake Near. Doesn't have anybody pushing him, but it doesn't seem to matter as he'll get into turn one underneath McCoy. So put Near, I'm not going to use your joke. I almost did it. I almost said to put him near the front, but I'm, I, I'm not going to do it again. That's your joke. And we've already used it up for tonight. We'll have to wait until the next race. But they're three wide for the lead down the back straightaway. Look at this middle lane. Get a big push. That's the 51 of Shade along with Jose Mejia. Haven't talked about him in a while. Poking his nose up into the fray as well. They're still three wide for the lead going into turn three and give the advantage on the bottom right now for the moment to Cherry, but he's going to lose his momentum, slides up the racetrack just a little bit, but backs out of it. Nice run. Here comes Blake Near to the front. Blake Near just pinched Nathaniel Cherry right there on the bottom, and Cherry could not get the run at all, and it was a bit of a, a risky move to say the least because that very easily could have led to contact and spun the 14 out in front of the field, but as it stands, Near's beginning to find some speed in that middle groove. He's really the first one all night to take advantage of that lane, and he's making it work for him because he's got his 14 hooked up, and he's not far away from clearing uh. the 49 car to go get the race lead. Makes me think of Celine Dion with near, far, wherever you are. Uh, I'll be here in your heart. Uh, uh. <laughs> See, here's the problem is that there are about three or four different lines that she uses. No, um, no, I believe that the heart does go on. There we go. There we go. The, the racing goes on. That's for the, sure. The, the racing, racing nearly caused the wreck. Goodness. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I think we're going to I think that's going to be the thing. We're going to try and make a thing out of this. They're three wide for fourth place. Look at Lyde coming on the bottom side. Mejia just backs out of it. Wise move there as he goes still three wide. But Reynolds and Jacob Porter I haven't talked about Porter in a while since he was uh, part of a wreck earlier on in this race, but got the three rolling. Nathaniel Cherry trying to recover as well. But Blake near out front has got Johnny Shade on the back bumper, pushing him along. It's a good quality race in here. I mean, if we're just going to continue with the musical references, we got a little bit of Blake near in the front, a little bit of Brent McCoy off to the side, a little nope, bit of nope, Johnny nope. Shade right behind. <laughs> nope. Not it touching is true. It. it is true. It is factual. And the horns in that song are great. But we'll digress from being hilariously uber 90s fans and get back to the actual action here because right now it's Blake Near really, really finding his way out in the front of all of this. Uh, yes, producer, I, I see your note there. I, I will not repeat on broadcast, but oh, I, know exactly, <laughs> I, I know exactly where you're going with that. So but here's the problem. <laughs> we don't really have a Monica here. So anybody named Monica, come out and come race so we can finish off the joke. And who knows, you might be able to come out and win some big chunk of the purse here for the Putty B Sports Street Stock Series, which my memory serves me correct, is $500. That's not bad. That's nothing to sneeze at. I uh, 
Better than a poke in the eye, that's for sure. But I tell you, who's poking around still is Brent McCoy trying to make that high side work and often without a lot of help from behind. He's hoping that John Lyday in the 22 will suck up to him there in the good red Chevy. Shades of Earnhardt on the outside, but he's got other ideas. He swings way up against the wall. They're three wide. Brent McCoy's got to be feeling like the man left in the middle all by himself in the sucker hole as Lyde and Vandervoort work the outside lane. But when you get down to the corner, it just doesn't work. You see him arch it back down to the middle. You just don't want to be all the way out there. Uh, look at Nathaniel Cherry working his way back up on the bottom side as well. I think Blake Nears really figured out something here. If you can find a way to make that middle work and not get beat off the corner, that's exactly where you want to be because you can basically get the best of both worlds. You can get people stopped up on the bottom, but you can also get a decent run to control the top lane too. And Nears really found something here that I think everyone behind the 14 will take note of at this moment. Well, you figure something out, somebody's going to take advantage of it and put it to work for them as well. And really the thing you got to be careful about, and I've seen it a couple times already for Blake Near. He makes a, a slow move to cut the advances of Johnny Shade. You got to be quick with that decision. Otherwise, you run the risk of getting hooked because a guy doesn't think you're going to keep coming down. You got to make those decisions fast and cover the spot if you're going to do a little bit of blocking. So these guys got to be on their toes if that's what they're going to do. But I think you're right because if you get to the back bumper, the guy on exit, you don't really want to tap him because you could spin him out. So you check up, you lose all your momentum down these long straightaways, and it's really hard just to pass somebody doing it that way. So Blake Deer uh, near doing a nice job of manipulating the traffic right now as we see a little bit of separation through the top five. Back to John Lyde, Ralph Vandervoorst, and Jacob Porter as well. These guys, uh, a lot more single file, not as intense racing as we saw before the competition yellow. Yeah, and starting to settle into a groove now, which I figured they would do at some point, but it's near. It's Johnny Shade who tried to go up there, and I couldn't tell if he was just trying to throw Brent McCoy out of his run and break it up, or if he was actually trying to block the 29. But in either case, they're still side-by-side -side running for the second spot. Then it's Jose Mejia, who's been up near the front for a good chunk of this night. John Lyde, who was sideways in turn three some 20 laps ago, but has driven his way back up to the front of this field. Then... You've got, I think that's Ralph Vandervoort there, and then Jacob Porter just hanging around. And I almost wonder if they're waiting for something to happen here, just sort of biding the time. Oh, waiting for something to happen because the 29 got loose. 29 got loose and just about lost it. But as it stands, he'll just slide to the back of the field. But all of a sudden, uh, I think, did he come down on the 51? Yes, a little bit of contact between Johnny Shade and Brent McCoy set McCoy up the hill. McCoy drops all the way to the back of the lead pack, as does John Lyde. Those two lose a ton of time on the rest of this, so they'll have to regroup and figure out how to make all this work. But in the meantime, Blake Near now is really in control of the front of this, and that, I think, brought Jose Mejia up to that second spot on the inside. Shade decided to jump to the outside to try and become the first driver in that lane and get some help from Ralph Vandervoort, who has been up near that top line all night, almost running the Larson line. as a yeah, doing a nice job up on the outside lane, but you see how the bottom lane pulls harder through the center. Look how Porter and Shade nearly come together off of turn four there. They'll get it back single file now. Vandervoort's latching onto the back bumper of Shade, and here comes Darren Cole. Haven't said his name in a while, bringing the 87 of Keith Haney with him to the outside. So again, the shuffling every lap. Guys just trying to find the place where they can run flat out, not have to lift, not put too much steering input into it. That's really the big key here. You can keep your foot in it, not have to lift. As Cole goes way up the racetrack, he's going to lose out and gets freight train. He'll fall to the back of this lead pack. Now we'll call it an eight-car lead pack as they scramble behind him because of the dust-up with the 29 and the 22. But uh, look at Blake Near still out front. He's got Porter and Mejia side by side behind him. Really, really clean running here and now through that front four or five. They fi I think they finally hit the point where they just wanted, well, I thought they hit the point where they just wanted to be in a line. But Jacob Porter and Ralph Vandervoort have other ideas. And Johnny Shade is just going to hang tight on the bottom and say, you know what, you guys go up there and do that. And we'll see what happens here when we get 20 laps from now when we actually take the checkered flag on this race. See who actually ends up in front of this winning race as it stands. Porter now trying to get a good run on the outside, and that might be the one difference here between proper restrictor plate racing and this sort of quasi restrictor plate racing that you see in front of you right now with the street stocks is that you're not necessarily beholden to the draft, and if you get a good run on someone and you're all by yourself, you can find a way to make it work, especially if you pull off the side track. 
There's a lot of tricks to the trade when it comes to getting a street stock around Michigan with success, and you've been watching it for the past 56 laps or so. Blake Neer has done the best job to hold off the advances, but as I say that, here comes Jose Mejia down on the bottom side. Here comes Jacob Porter up on the top side as they're three wide for the lead once again. Mejia on the bottom, Neer in the middle, Porter up top. Who is it going to be that wins out here? Mejia has no help. You see the power of that middle lane as Neer just squirts ahead. It's going to shove it up the racetrack a little bit. The slide job's not going to stick. Here comes Jacob Porter in the number three. Three things are getting real tense here now down the back straightaway. I know. I look at this and I think if this is Charlotte, you just sit on the bottom and block everybody trying to make the land and make sure you don't come up off it so no one can get a run on the outside. But that's Charlotte. You only have two lanes to run. This is Michigan. You've got four or five, and you can't just sit on the bottom and block. You've got to find a way to jump between lanes in order to hold the lead. And that's what Blake Neer has done better than anyone else in this race so far be able to bounce between the middle the inside the outside to control this race no one's done it as well as he has so far but now he's gotten some new blood competition johnny shade hasn't been up near the front all that much until this stint in the race same can be said about jacob porter but now that they're here i think they're getting a little bit antsy they want to try and make something happen porter will be the next man to challenge near he'll go to the outside with a decent run and help from Ralph Vandervoorst and Keith Haney, who have been running at the front a little bit earlier, got caught up in that big, big incident right there at the end of the first step before the competition crossed and all of a sudden has found his way back up into the top 10. Keith Haney has been one of the best pushers in the field I have noticed over the course of this race. He's real comfortable getting up to a guy, giving him a good tap on the rear bumper, not upsetting the car in front of him and giving him a good run down the straightaways as he does it there once again to Vandervoorst. So... Nice job there. These guys are being pretty tidy running side by side. You saw Mejia make a bid for the lead. He falls all the way back to seventh, trying to use that inside lane. I think if the move is going to come, you're going to have to do it through the middle with help as Blake Neer jumps to the top side to once again, block the advances of Jacob Porter. Porter not lifting, and here we go once again. Big scramble down the back straightaway. Is this going to work? Contact, more contact there as Haney is into the back of the 18 of Cherry. I don't know how they didn't wreck. They're now four wide. Contact, the 18's going around in turn three. 18's going to go down on the bottom, come back up. Oh, what a it, save. Get caught in the banking, so there probably won't be a yellow on that, but that, that certainly isn't for the lack of trying. And Keith Haney was all over the rear bumper of Nathaniel Cherry. And Cherry, I think, tried to get out from in front of him just to avoid getting moved like that, but couldn't quite do it in time. So Haney will come up with spot. A lot of racing there just at the back of this lead pack. That's the 09 of Herman Reynolds and Haney dashing back and forth and up and down and all around left and right around this front straightaway. But guess what? Still Blake near in control of this thing. Vandervoort's now to second as I think that was Porter dropping back a little bit. Gets a really, really good bump here from Ralph Vandervoort. Does Blake near. And I think I'm beginning to hit this mindset where I think if, if you're going to get around Blake near, it's going to have to be a group effort of two or three or maybe four drivers if they decide not to wreck each other here. A little bit of contact between, I think that was Johnny Shade and then Jose Mejia bouncing off each other ever so slightly. But I, I think you will have to team up and really, really go after it. We're seeing Ralph Vandervoort and Jacob Porter do a nice job of that on the outside, but I think they need more help than that. I think it's going to have to be at least three, maybe four, maybe even perhaps five guys to get around Blake Near because he's got the control of this from the front of the field covered. Yeah, Blake Near is doing a fantastic job dictating the pace of this race, but he's getting ganged up now. As you see, Shade jump to the top side as well. I think they were listening to the broadcast, James. I think they heard you as Blake Near will dive down to the bottom to try and take the shortest way around and slide all the way up. Here comes the big slide job. Is it going to work? Oh, there's contact, and he somehow pulls it up. Porter sideways. Can he hang on to it? Yes, he uses the wall. Wow, what a move there. Oh, somehow, somehow they kept it together. I have no idea, no idea how they didn't come back onto the track and didn't wreck within that little incident there. Somehow they managed to keep it together, but maybe more importantly, that gave Blake Near and Ralph Vandervoort big-time control over this field here as we work lap 62 of 75 closing in on 10 to go here so now if you're ralph vandervoort how do you play this knowing that i think the other drivers are going to try and get in the draft and get caught back up because we're beginning to come down to the end of this thing and we're starting to run out of laps to make a charge to the front of the field unless you hook up and come together and run nose to tail and get back up to the front of this field 
We're starting to see it now with Jose Mejia and Johnny Shade. Keith Haney's already jumping into that bunch as well. Herman Reynolds, I think, is going to try and latch on to the rear of the 87 machine, but everybody else in the back half of this that was up at the front, they've got to start going now if they want to catch any of these top five drivers. If you're wondering why the intensity has seemingly ratcheted up to 10, it's because we are closing in on 10 laps to go here in uh, just a few laps, I should say. We're on lap 63 right now. But, yeah, it's time to go. If you're going to get it, you got to get it while the getting is good. Ralph Vandervoort's in the best position possible. He's got to work with Jose Mejia here if they're going to get around Blake Neer. And, you know, they were trying to do it before it all went wacky a few laps ago. They had the right idea, but when you break these cars up and they start running side by side, it brings everybody else up to you. So I'm curious now if Vandervoorst and Mejia are content just to ride in line and try and get away from the guys behind them so they can just sort of fight it out between the three of them. But Johnny Shade in fourth trying to reel these guys back in. I think before it's all said and done, we're going to see this uh, three-car breakaway form back up into one large pack. And if we're lucky, they'll all be sliding on fire upside down across the line for the checkered flag. See if anybody decides to go. Clint Boyer just without the flames here. As we watch Blake Neer still in the front of this here, working lap 64, so really getting down to it now. Got a little bump there, though, from Ralph Vandervoort. The car went just a little bit sideways on the front straightaway, so uh, it makes me wonder if Vandervoort might be in the prime position to take advantage of this because, in theory, it would be very easy for him to just give a little slight tap to Blake Neer on corner entry and... And just move him out of the way a little bit to go get the lead. The question is, A, does he do that? And B, if he decides to do that, when does he do that? Well, if you're going to take a guy and move him out of your way, you don't want to give him an opportunity to get back to you and do the same in return. So if you're going to do it, you should probably do it on the last lap going into turn three. That would be my objective if that's the route that I was going to take, but I think Vandervoort is actually not in the best position. I think Jose Mejia is. He's going to dictate what happens here. He can leave Vandervoort out to dry if he really wants to. Blake Neer, all he has to do is leave Vandervoort, and he's got another car behind him as they go into three. Here comes Mejia sending it in deep. That just gives all the advantage still to Blake Neer. I think it's going to take a better effort as Shade draws in now as well. So again, these guys, it's not going to help to fight for second place. They're going to have to gang up on Blake Neer if they're going to execute this pass. Neer has figured out what he has to do. Work in the lanes of the draft, but here we go. They're going to go too wide, two rows deep for the lead. Can Mejia use shade to get to the lead? Yellow flag, though. Big wreck on the back straightaway here. It's the 20 dime machine of Brent McCoy, who had been in control for a very significant portion of this race. Just trying to see what happened here. I think this actually started with the 03, who got turned by Jacob Porter down the front straightaway, and then it looks like the 29 had some help from Nathaniel Cherry, who just didn't have anywhere to go while checking up, but it brings everybody back together within 10 laps to go. David Schildhouse, and uh, if you weren't having fun already, I think you're about to have a lot more of it because we are now going to see a proper dash for the finish. Also, of note, I was going to touch Max on the Lions' second trivia question. There were so many answers that came in before we could get to it that it sort of just covered itself. Although I do like the idea of David Schildhouse being the answer to the question, which driver has been the runner-up for the NASCAR championship more than the others. Credit to Colin Keister on that one. Yeah, he would know better than most, I can tell you that. But uh, unfortunately, only in the sim side of things. I do have a championship to my credit and uh, on the sim side, but definitely not in real life. But here we go. This is going to set up a, uh, a last uh, a last gasp attempt, I think, for a lot of these drivers to, to throw a Hail Mary to get to the front. Um, so uh, this wasn't manufactured drama, I tell you. They, it was a genuine wreck that brought out the yellow flag. But, James, it couldn't set us up any better for the most exciting finish possible to start things off here. And I have a, a pretty strong feeling before this thing's all said and done, there's going to be some uh, bent sheet metal and hurt feelings. What do you think? I would not be surprised. Ah, aha. I see. I see what he's done there. So um, I guess trivia question for anyone here as the camera goes off a little bit. If anybody knows where that graphic comes from, gold star and a mention on the broadcast without question. That isn't David Schildhouse. Good gracious. Come on. Come on. You're Sorry. killing me. You're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> You're killing me. So, um, well, well, let's see if anybody else is smarter. Uh, if anybody wants to name his 
uh, favorite cohort of sorts. The producer and I here at Putting Me Sports have a long standing love of this series. So uh, I can tell you it is definitely not Dennis the Menace, Helen R. Racing, but we appreciate the effort. But a uh, main point here, though, uh, it's going to be Blake Near leading this field. We're going to get a restart with somewhere in the neighborhood of five laps to go, but a friendly reminder unlimited green white checkered so uh we'll see we'll, we'll see what happens here but something tells me we might be using some of those probably i've seen it uh many a time in sim racing when you give drivers the opportunity to to do it over and over and over again uh they generally are more than happy to oblige but for now i think blake near might be a uh, little sad that that caution flew. I think he had a really good handle on things. I think he was really uh, in a prime position to, to take the checker flag, really was doing a masterful job of manipulating the draft, working the lanes all across this raceway, and holding on to the lead despite the advances of guys like Jose Mejia, Ralph Vandervorst, Johnny Shade. Um, but now everyone's going to be bunched back up together, and this sets up all the drama in the world. He can't block them all, so what he's got to hope for it's a clean breakaway and guys fighting behind him for second on back that allows him to sort of drive more out of the rearview mirror than out the windshield and keep his focus on keeping everybody behind him. Whoa, guess what, David? <laughs> you so weren't ready for that at all. But... No, I really wasn't. I really wasn't. I was trying to decide where to go with it, but I'll just say, what, James Pike? Oh, guess what? It sounds like we have a winner. It is indeed Homestar Runner, Kevin Fetting. Uh, technically speaking, it is the cheat, but off of Homestar Runner. So uh, I, I will give a nod to the brothers Chapman for their internet excellence and a nod to Kevin Fetty for getting my trivia question of the evening correct. So I kind of wish we had some form of fan boost, as Dan Viding is saying, to give to one of these drivers. That would be interesting, to say the least. I'd be curious to see who would win that. But It wouldn't be Blake Near, I guarantee you that. Yeah, I, yeah, I figure it probably wouldn't be Blake Near, because uh, you, you would think here. I, I have a feeling that most of the people here are thinking, oh, man, let's shake it up. Let's get somebody to maybe go after him and find a way to break him up, because if he hasn't put on a Stuart haas s performance a la Talladega in the fall in the second half of this race. I don't know how to describe it because it, it just has been masterful work from Blake Near at the front of this field. Can everyone else in this field find a way to come together, strategize, and get around him? That's the biggest question floating through my mind right now. Well, it's a question floating through your mind and the minds of others as well, but Blake Nears probably wondered what he's going to have to endure over the last handful of laps to get this checkered flag that he probably feels he's entitled to at this point, having led more laps than anybody else and doing a fantastic job of holding the whole field off. But really, he's he's a sitting duck right now. I don't care which way you slice it. He's at the mercy of everybody else because they're going to be to his outside. They're going to be ganging up behind him, and they're all getting his draft, and he's got nobody to get draft from in front of him. So he's blocking all the air he's in the worst position possible. So Blake Neer's got to go super defensive. And typically when guys go super defensive, James Pike, that's when you see the really big one. The really, really big one because now the lights are off on the pace car. So now we begin to see how this shakes out. Working a lap 70 of 75 at this point. So the green flag will come on lap 71 with five laps to go. We do have unlimited green-white checkers of note. So if we get a yellow, once we get the restart, we're going to have our first attempt at a green-white checkered after this race has gone final in the eyes of iRacing, but will not go final in the eyes of our competition directors and scoring tower. So uh, we shall see how these things shake out. But as it stands, Blake Near, Jose Mejia, Ralph Vandervorst, Johnny Shade, Keith Haney, Herman Reynolds, John Lyde, Jacob Porter, Nathaniel Cherry, Wesley Whitfield, your top 10 for this, what could be, I have a sneaky this probably won't be, but could be the final restart of the evening. I don't think it's the final restart of the evening. I'll just disagree for the sake of disagreeing. I think we're going to see some contact. I think we're going to see some guys much like you see Cisco Scaramuza at the bottom right corner of your screen. You're going to see some carnage here, but these are the best of the best. Let's see him do it here. James Pike, green flag about to fly. 
I can't wait to see Cisco's crazy face when he sees all this shake out. But here we go. Green flag coming five laps to go when they cross the stripe. Near gets a pretty solid restart. I think he almost made the 68 of Vandervoorst check up just a bit there. So Vandervoorst didn't get the best of starts. And he has been able to stick with Near decently well on the outside, or shall I say, stay near to Near. I'm, mm. I'm, I'm never going to get enough of that. But regardless, Near will clear everyone. He'll go to the front here. They're side by side already in the back there. He'll slide up in front of Mejia, tried to block him, cut off his lane, oh! and they make contact. And there he, okay, there we go. Now they're wrecking. Now they wreck, and that just took out, uh, I wouldn't say just oh. about everybody, but. Oh, my uh, goodness. Somebody yeah. is flipping down the back straight away. <laughs> Jacob Porter was the one who ended up flipping down the back straight. I couldn't tell who pile drove him. That was, I think, the 20, oh, what, three, four, oh, 24, yes, of Tom Morano. So, uh, yeah, yeah, ev everyone just died, basically, is what happened Oh, there. my goodness. What a wreck there. And it was just, it just went uh, screwy off of turn two. And really, I'll start up front when uh, Mejia got chopped off and it sort of checked up that outside lane. And guys... At this point, they're just not lifting, James. They're not going to. They're going to drive through it or drive into it. And uh, most of the guys chose to drive into it. So we're going to re-rack them, re-stack them, and try this thing one more time. But my God, the 24 of Tom Morano absolutely flew to the moon. Uh, uh, second time tonight, I think, as some of the people in the chat have noted, that uh, Keith Haney, I think, thought he had room on the outside and just didn't quite have it cleared. So the 51 was the victim of that. Johnny Shade had absolutely nowhere to go on that. Just got turned. got turned into Vandervorst. Uh, ended up with not too much damage, to be fair, for the amount of drivers who got swept up in this. Certainly didn't end up as uh, badly as Jacob Porter did. So, uh, he, he jokingly says in the chat, I don't know where I am. I guess EMS found me somewhere somehow. So, uh, a, a lot of drivers went upside down in all of that. Uh, Brent McCoy says he just lost a pair of shorts in all of that madness. So hopefully we can find Brent McCoy a new pair of shorts here in short order. Mm. Yeah, I'm I'm not having a great night. On that. So uh, I think or, you're or, or am I? Or am I? I was going to say, or am I having a great night on that? It depends on how you look at it. But uh, I think most importantly for those of you who have just joined us and have tuned in right for the end of this, we will have unlimited green white checker attempts. So. We will cross lap 75 here probably before we go green, but it will be a green-white checker finish that we get. We'll get the green, then the white, and then the checker, and we'll just keep on going if we need to in order to find a winner here. Could be interesting, could be fun, could see a few more wrecks before this is done. I'm just glad that I at least made the point to put your money on that not being the final restart of the night because somebody probably would have come home with about 5 to $10. Yeah, it, it, we're at the point where there, it's all take. There's no give anymore when it comes to give and take racing. It's all take right now. And we saw it with Blake Near with a very aggressive block off of turn two. And that's such a difficult place to try and uh, kill the momentum of your competition when they're trying to get a run to the outside. But that's ultimately what they're going to have to do. They're going to have to find a way around Blake Near, but he's going to do everything he can to chop that advance off, even at the risk of causing a wreck behind him. It doesn't hurt him if they all go wrecking behind him. So it's kind of a cutthroat tactic, but it is a tactic nonetheless that you can employ here, especially when these drivers are trying to work the draft and get big runs on you. So if I'm Jose Mejia, if I'm John Lyde, if I'm Nathaniel Cherry right now, I'm uh, sort of remembering what happened on that restart, and I'm, I'm formulating a plan to put myself in the best position possible. I might be sending a private message to the guys around me to say, hey, I didn't come here to run fourth here tonight. I want to get a checkered flag to start this thing off the right way. we got to work together to get around Blake Near. Are you with me? Are you with me? Are you trying to figure this out? Taking notes here, I think race control has just called for a single file restart here on the green white to try and end all this. So... Looking here at the pace car, lights are still on, so I think, in theory, we're going to get a green on what would be lap 76, I believe, if I've got that right. Perhaps. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's going to be right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, I do appreciate all the cheese references. Looks like we got a driver up here. We got the driver of uh, the number three of Jacob Porter up here in the booth. Jacob, you got a copy? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Well, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, wild ride down the back straightaway there. Tell us about it. Um, yeah, definitely so. Um, coming out too. Um, 
I, I was just trying to get all the positions I possibly could. Um, it's been a tough race, obviously. Um, and they just stacked it up in front of me. Um, so obviously you try to miss all the wrecks you possibly can. So try to turn it to the inside and it just didn't work out in my favor. And I ended up on my lid rolling nose over tail. So that's how this night's gone. Well, it was a, a big run uh, down the back straightaway for you and pretty spectacular to watch. But t uh, beyond that, talk about the racing action here at Michigan tonight on a scale of one to 10. How much fun have you been having? Um, I'm going to say a positive 10 because it has been um, an absolute blast from the front to the back. I got in an accident earlier in the race, went to the back, um, came back to the front, was fighting for the lead, um, still got in a little accident, and we're still able to contend for the lead. So um, it's been a blast. Well, it's been fun for us up here in the booth as well. And I uh, hate to see you go like that with a, a spectacular wreck, but looking forward for the rest of the season. What are your hopes? What are you looking to accomplish here? Um, I would like, I, I feel like as of tonight, um, the front running cars are um, all pretty equally matched. Um, we've got a good package going um, with our um, coal power Chevrolet. Um, so give us um, a couple weeks and we're going to, or uh, we'll be back next week, I guess, at Money or Craig. Uh, two weeks from now. Two weeks from now. Okay. Yeah, I think this year is going to be a good year for us. Are you uh, are you planning on participating in any other uh, Podium Esports tours this year? Um, yeah, we're running the Cars Tour um, with uh, Porter Cook Racing, and then we're I'm doing the Elite Series as well. Um, and then I might make some um, special events in the Truck Series. Absolutely, and we'll see you for the Daytona 500, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> All right, very good, Jacob. Good to talk with you. Glad you're okay. That's why it's a good thing it's a sim, but you put on one will of a show in the number three tonight. Shades of Earnhardt for sure, doing the number right, but uh, not the finish you wanted, but we'll look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks. Yes, sir. Thank you. And uh, until then, we'll see you, uh, well, I guess, for the elites uh, tomorrow. Yes, sir. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. So, there's Jacob Porter, driver of the number three car, who ended up doing a barrel roll. Uh... Star Fox style almost. So, mm. yeah, uh, as we continue this night of, re well, the first night of references, I'm thinking. <laughs> we got a long season. We got to save some of these. Right. Uh, so let's, <laughs> let's, let's make sure that this is all clear here because technically speaking, the drivers are taking the checkered flag right now, but what they are going to do is reorganize and reorder themselves here on the front straightaway for a green white checker restart when we take the green we'll have two laps to go won't pay attention to scoring on i racing here so uh, overlay is now set as you'll see it we are in overtime so if you have any questions and concerns you were trying to figure out what was going on there's your answer so Everybody's all set up here. Also of note, only drivers one lap down or higher up in the order are going to be participating in this screen white checkered finish. That being said, that doesn't really affect anyone who was already in trouble. Keith Haney is the first car any laps down, but he's four laps down. So let's go ahead and make sure that we reset this order here. This will technically be lap 76 that they start working. Blake Near is going to be your leader for what could be the last restart. Then Jose Mejia, John Lide, Nathaniel Cherry, Jeremy Adams, Wesley Whitfield, Troy Lint, Darren Cole, Stevie Minson, Jonathan Lawrence, your top 10 here as they get ready to take the green flag with what will be two laps to go. The drivers also, since you're curious, wondering, Jeremy Watkins, Brent McCoy, Herman Reynolds, Frank Morales, Johnny Shade, and Ralph Vandervorst, the 16th car here, the last one out on track. Pace car is off on pit road. Blake Near will control them once again. Mejia tried to jump it, couldn't quite hit it the same way he needed to. Lide got a pretty good run on the bottom, so he'll go with Blake Near and try and make something happen. Blake Near will clear Mejia. Lide will be alongside Mejia, and then they'll be double file a little bit further back there. Two laps to go here for the first time as they come through turn one. Well, I know if I look up in the rearview mirror and I see a good wrench Chevrolet behind me, I'm a little bit worried, but look at this. He's going to get hooked by Mejia hard in the outside wall. Gets caught by the 71 as well. Unfortunate for John Lide, but you knew it was coming as he drifted up the track. And now it's Wesley Whitfield's turn to go over like a pinball here. So just looking to see what happened here as 
we look back at the replay and try and sort everything out once again. Lide was just absolutely flung across the front of this. Uh, very, very quickly figured that one out. He, uh, I think he just got hooked there by me. Uh, racing for the same spot, obviously, but uh, pinballed off the wall, made contact with Whitfield. So that's how Whitfield got started, was that he initially made contact with Lyde as Lyde came back across. Then he got hit by the 90 machine of Jeremy Watkins as he came back down the track, and that's what sent Whitfield's car over. So uh, pretty straightforward racing incident there. Uh, you have two guys running for the same spot. They turn into each other, and uh, it doesn't work out all that well more often than not. No, and that's really the move that everybody's trying to make on Blake Near is to get up alongside him coming off of turn two. And so far, the field is 0 for 2 and trying to make that work. Um, and unfortunately for John Lyday, uh, he didn't really have much he could do there. He was sort of uh, at the mercy of Jose Mejia, and, and it just went uh, wrong from there. But look at the 89, if you will. Jeremy Adams hasn't talked about him a lot here tonight, but he's inside that uh, second row. Uh, so he'll be restarting third, I suppose, uh, which is good for him. Um, and, you know, could look to make some noise here right at the end. Quiet run, but you make noise at the end. That's the right way to do it, I guess. Might be the way to do it. So, hearing from race control that Matt was ruled as an equal fault wreck between the 46 and the 22 nose prize there. So, and we'll see if I don't think either of them have made it back out on track. But what I do know is that we're getting ready to go back green for another attempt at the green, white, and checker. Lide, I do not see on track. Mejia is back at the line taking his EOL. And I think it's what the 14 and then the 18 that are up at the front here, then the 89. We get the green flag one more time. Here comes Near. I think Cherry got a much, much better go on that restart there. He'll at least beat Near to the line. The question is, will he have to give it back? Will Near catch back up to him? Will Near side draft him? We'll see here in just a moment. You've got Near on the inside there. A lot of cars bouncing around towards the back of this pack. A little bit of contact between them there. They'll manage to keep it going, though. Near will go back to the front of this, though, and then oh. he'll make contact with Cherry. Cherry will go out the track. Near still in front of this thing. One car down on the apron, way on the back of the field. Oh, boy. Bouncing and banging up each other. Cherry still finding a way to hang on to it. Here comes the 89. We'll see what happens when they come into three. Oh, this is a mad scramble here as they go into three. Blake Near doing his best to block three lanes of racing traffic as Jeremy Adams tries to work through the middle. That's really going to be the hot note if he can make it work. But Nathaniel Cherry on the outside is killing that move. They're four wide for second place off of turn four. Don't forget about Stevie Mintz and his more contact. The 29. Where did he come from? Haven't four about wide for second as they take the white flag. Here comes the O3 oh. across the front of the nose. I think they'll keep going here since they took the white. Waiting to see if we get any caution. No caution yet. Those cars wreck. So now it's Blake Near on the 29. The 29 machine of Brent McCoy, who was up at the front, got caught in a wreck, had to make his way through the back of the field. Now it's at the front of this year with half a lap to go. Racing back to the checkered flag. They're two wide, two rows deep. Don't forget about Stevie Minson in the 96. Where has he been all night up front when it matters the most? They dive down to the bottom through three and four for the last time, James Pike. Here they come. It looks like the 29 tries to get a run to the outside. Near can't stop it. Here comes Brent McCoy running side by side with Blake Near to come to the start finish line. It's going to be Brent McCoy with the last lap run on the outside to win a wild and wacky opener for the Podium Esports Street Sack Series at Michigan. And I think the craziness was just enough to throw Blake Near off. He controlled it so well for a good chunk of the second half of this race, but just couldn't quite do it when he had all the hounds coming after him. And Brent McCoy, who maybe had one of the wildest trips of all in this race, finds a way to come back after getting wrecked midway through it, ran in the back for a good chunk of the second half of this race, and then in the final, green-white checkered, found his way to the front, got a run on the outside, played it perfectly. He checked up a little bit early in turn three to make sure he got the run on the outside, put his foot to the floor and went all the way around the outside, around Blake Near, and to the checkered flag first. Unbelievable move from Brent McCoy, who, like you said, spent much of this race up front before the incident, found a way back up there and took advantage of a very preoccupied and distracted Blake Near, who uh, missed the move that he needed to make to block him off 
couldn't make it happen, was too uh, preoccupied with what was happening behind him. And now McCoy gets to do some celebratory donuts here at the start finish line at Michigan, taking the checkered flag in a truly thrilling and heart stopping fashion. A tremendous, tremendous finish here to the season opener for the Podium Eastbourne Street Stock Series. We'll take a quick break here and give you a chance to see our Daytona 500 promo one more time if you haven't had the chance to do so already before we talk to some of your top finishers in tonight's Podium Esports post-race show. History. Richard Petty goes back in front. They both spin. They're in the wall. Petty is sliding. Tradition. He's going to make it. Dale Jarrett's going to win the Daytona 500. Prestige. For the race leader for the win, Martin down low. Kevin Harvick wheel to wheel push wins. Passion. And Dale Earnhardt is going to win the Daytona 500 in his 20th try. All to find their way here. On the Daytona 500. On the Daytona 500. To rise above and become one of the greats the world center of racing. On February 10th, we invite you to join us to write a new chapter. This time, it's your turn. Welcome back to the post race show here for the Podium Esports Street Stock Series season opener from Michigan International Speedway 2014. And a very, very wild finish to the end of this season. Brent McCoy and the number 29 machine come away with the first victory of 2019. And David, that, that was just nuts all the way through, I think, to say the least. <laughs> Absolutely lived up to all of my expectations and exceeded them to a very high degree. Uh, the power move on the outside to take the win away after Blake Near had pretty much dominated the latter portions of this race, looked unbeatable working all the lanes expertly, and then just loses it in the last couple hundred yards. Uh, just heartbreak for him, and we'll hear from him in the post-race show, but sheer elation for uh, for McCoy as well to rebound like he did, ups and downs, but my goodness, 75 laps almost didn't seem like enough. And somehow, yeah, I feel quite satisfied at the amount of racing that I've seen here for tonight. I think I've got a good, good feel of it, but as it stands, we've got some drivers to talk to. So let's go ahead and knock out the first winter view of 2019. And uh, I guess you get a little bit of a cherry on top there, Brent, because you're the first driver to win a race in an official capacity for any podium esports series. But I think more importantly, the way in which you did it, having gotten caught up in the incidents after dominating a good chunk of the first half of this race and then finding a way to come back and get it right at the end. I think let's let's go to the patience first. A after getting spun and getting sent all the way back there, how'd you find it within yourself to regroup mentally and rebound? How'd you do it? I um I came into this race thinking that it was going to be kind of like a uh, super speedway race, you know, and those super speedway races, anything can happen, and usually it does. And I started, I think it was P19 at one point towards the second end after getting spun out, and I was frustrated, and 
talking to some teammates on a uh, team speak, got me calmed down. And they're like, look, man, anything can happen. And um, it sure did. And we had to dodge a couple more wrecks throughout that entire time, but it went from P9 to P1 towards the end right there. And it, uh, it worked out extremely well, I'd say. To say the least, uh, I think you're right about that. Uh, I think this is a special night. It's, it's the first ever official broadcast for us at Podium Esports. And you are the first ever winner of any official race for any of our series, period. It's obviously a significant night for us in the broadcast then, but for you to hold that title, what does that mean to you? Yeah, that's something that no one's going to be able to take away from you, right? I mean, from a Podium Esports, from you guys, everyone involved in Podium Esports, from the drivers on the track to the fans watching on on Twitch, to even myself, I know I had this this um, this series when it first came out. I'm like, do I really want to do this? And then it, I committed to it. And um, even today, getting off work, I was excited. I was ready to go. And to just have the the amount of fun that was had between all of us today and to have that first win, not only in the Street Stock Series for the first win of the season, but for the all podium esports as a whole, um, it worked out pretty well. And I'm excited and grateful to have that. And I hope everyone enjoyed that. Brent, I know there are a lot of people that make it happen for you. So go ahead and give your thanks and your shout outs to everyone here on this 29 team that's responsible for it. Yeah, I want to give a shout out to uh, Bobby Jonas, Jonas Graphics. Uh, without him and the paint scheme that he put together for this team, it was kind of a last minute deal that we that we put together here. And he's been he asked for my input on what I wanted and he added his input as well. And it worked out extremely well. The iRacers Lounge, also another um, group that I'm involved with. It's been nothing but a great time with those guys. So everyone at iRacers Lounge uh, who enjoys listening to the podcast. Um, I greatly appreciate all your guys' efforts. So, and finally, to Podium Esports, man, you guys put on a put on a hell of a show and a hell of a uh, production, and I greatly appreciate it. And I know all of us drivers here greatly appreciate it. So, to you guys, thank you. Thank you for the time, Brent. Congratulations on being the first official Podium Esports winner, and we will see you at Lanier for the next Street Stock Series race. All right, let's get at it. Thank you, guys. There's Brent McCoy for you, and we will slide from Brent McCoy to the driver of the number 14 machine, Blake Near, who comes up runner-up in this race, and he is with David Schildhouse. I hate to use the joke, but you were so near a win tonight, <laughs> Blake, and coming off the last corner, it all went south. Walk us through it. Well, he had a pretty good run off the back stretch. I thought I could just be able to just either send it in and kind of slide up right in front of him and slow his run down, or just keep her low and hope for the best you done such a great job up to that point and and working the traffic working the lanes keeping everybody behind you what was the key to to being out front for so long just watching your mirrors watching where the runs come and watch where everybody's like if they're coming low or coming high just trying like half a car there half a car there block with all the cautions at the end, did you worry about everyone getting back up to you and, and taking a win away, or, or did you really feel the confidence that you were still going to take that checkered flag? I felt like I would be able to still hold them all off if just if there's because if they're battling four by four and stuff back there, then it shouldn't be too hard. But at that last run there, I just, just came off on the top line just out of nowhere. It was a power move for sure, and you definitely had your hands full. There were a couple of guys jockeying for position behind you, but uh, it was too late at that point, and it was a run to the checkered flag. Came up just a bit short, but all that aside, even a second-place finish has to feel good overall. How much fun did you have here tonight? Oh, it was great under green flag, and then yellows just kill you. Yellows are just so long. Here. I think we're doing like a minute 20 laps or something under yellow, so... It definitely took some time to get around under yellow, but the green flag action more than made up for it. And Blake, I got to give you the microphone one more time to say hello to friends, family, sponsors, and everyone else who helps you and the number 14 get it done. Uh, just uh, my girlfriend, Bray out there, uh, Jake Watson, CN Chassis, not alive anymore, but we still have him on a car. Uh, Brandon Wilkinson, that's pretty much it. Awesome. A great job here tonight. We'll look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks at Lanier. Perfect. Thanks. Second place finisher there, Blake Near. He was uh, within a shouting distance of a checkered flag and a win here tonight, but just came up a little bit short. But uh, James, what do you say? We have an opportunity to hear from our third place finisher, Jeremy Adams. Drag him up in here and hear what he has to say. Jeremy Adams, who, you know, I, I think 
we have a tale of two very different races with Blake near and with Brent McCoy, where they both sort of ran up and dominated this thing at the front end. And Jeremy, you're, you're sort of the one that just waited until the very end. And then when the time came, you just jumped up and snatched a good finish out of the rest of this. So how did you sort of just tackle this race? Because you were more towards the back of the field, especially in the front end of this, as everybody was wrecking in the early stages. Of this. Uh, my thought was just let them wreck. And then uh, after the after the break there, then get a little more aggressive when you get everybody out that was being overly aggressive and just continue to do it. So after it weeded it out a little bit, then I tried, but then I kind of got stuck several seconds down and couldn't catch the pack. And luckily we got that caution, but I don't know. I just feel lucky to get what we got and get out of here and get to a short track. I had a feeling you'd probably say something like that because these aren't necessarily where you're used to running the street stocks, but we know through your experience with the cars, Esport tour that, we get to Lanier in a few weeks. You're going to be more than a little bit excited for that, I figure. Yeah, anything where we're going to hit the brakes, I'm happy about. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, after a night like this where you have 30 drivers coming out, how excited are you to see us get to that and to get to heat racing, to get to all sorts of madness, just that the format that you're so used to and that you thrive in? Uh, I don't know. I can't wait. I just can't wait to get to the short track format. and then that'll be a little more in i told everybody today if i come out here with the top five i'll be extremely happy and it'll feel like a win so i think i done even better getting third and happy and happy to get to a better place next week so you come out of here even more than extremely happy which is a pretty good way to end the night i'd say so who makes it happen for you jeremy and who do you need to thank oh uh, everybody at team vincere peterson irrigation uh all our teammates um uh, I'm sure I'm leaving some people out, but it's the first race of the year. I'm sure I'll get them later in the year, but just thanks to everybody helps. Well, big congratulations to you, Jeremy, and your top three finish tonight. And we will see you at Lanier when we finally go short tracking. Yep. We'll see you then, Pac. Appreciate it. So there's Jeremy Adams for you. And just like that, David, here we are. And I guess the end is near for tonight, but I think it's important to emphasize tonight. Because, oh, do we have so much coming up on this channel within the next week. Well, I think you can hear the smile that's on my face right now when I say we are near to some racing action. And that's it for the near puns tonight, I promise. But yeah, more racing action to come. And what a start for the 2019 season for the Street Stock Series and for Podium Esports as a whole. Uh, just phenomenal, better than uh, I think any of us could have ever hoped for. A uh, fantastic race was thrown in there, too, amongst all the entertainment and to share James and Cisco doing an amazing job bringing all the racing action to the fans on Twitch and all their fantastic interaction in the chat as well. That's as satisfying as it gets, and that's a job well done. And many, many thanks to you, David, for all your work tonight. But before we let all of you go here, let's run through the schedule for all of the action that you're going to see on the Podium Esports Twitch channel right here all throughout the next week. We start off tomorrow night. We've got all sorts of epic, epic Class A racing from Daytona 2007. It's the season opener for the Silver Division of the Podium Esports Elite Series, and they will go broadcast time will start at 8 25 p.m eastern standard time we'll have two dual races for 20 laps and an 80 lap 200 mile season opening daytona 200 on the 2007 version of daytona not the new one but the old bumpy one where the car is just bounced around in the draft you'll see the top drivers in class a racing go at it as part of the best competition in some racing here on podium esports for their first crack at the season opener for the Podium Esports Elite Series Silver Division. And then we run the trucks, a big, big night of competition for the trucks this Sunday, January the 6th. It's silver and gold division coming up that night. Airtime will be 5.55 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for 
two dual races, the silver feature race, 80 laps, also 200 miles, and then the gold division race as well. No duels, but 100 laps of action for the gold division. So a huge, huge night of racing on the 6th of January. If you want to camp out with us for a few hours of the broadcast and hang with us and, I don't know, maybe get us dinner too, that'd be great. But well, regardless, tons and tons of action from Daytona 2007 coming up on Sunday. And then January 10th, next Thursday night. The season opener for the gold division of the Podium Esports Elite Series. 250 miles, 100 watts from Daytona. 07, the absolute best competition in sim racing. The fastest 40 drivers from the Podium Esports Qualification Series will take to Daytona for the first time and showcase what they have. And oh, by the way, if you couldn't get enough of the short track action, guess what? We also have some of that for you, too. Coming up, airtime will also be 8.55 for the season opener for the Cars Esport Tour. Next Wednesday night, Southern National Motorsports Park in Kinley, North Carolina is where we'll be. And you can catch some of the best late model stock competition in sim racing there. It's going to airtime 8.55 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But for now, we will go ahead and wrap things up. So, for everyone at Podium Esports, for DJ Lyon, for Gary Sexton, James Krahula, Kyle Barnes, Cisco Scaramuza, and David Schildhouse up here in the booth with me, I am James Pike, the voice of Podium Esports, saying thank you so much for watching tonight's broadcast. And we will see you right back here on the Podium Esports Twitch channel tomorrow night, airtime 8.25 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the season opener of the Podium Esports Elite Series Silver Division live from Daytona 07. For more information on Podium Esports, don't forget to visit www.podiumesports.com. Thank you all so much for watching and good night.